Okay, we're back. We're back on. Uh, sorry about that chat. I still have everything from the previous one. I still have all the super chats, uh, which we will we will start reading in a little bit here. Um, but uh, yeah, so for whatever reason, my internet uh, hiccuped and then came back really quickly. So who knows what that was? It's just a, the joy of Spectrum Internet is that that happens. Uh, but and yes, I know all about failovers and everything. Uh, so you can lecture me all you want in the chat and I will just give you a middle finger privately later. Uh, and, uh, like, like, uh, like Chris Chan did to his mom. Um, and you know, that used to be one of the ways you could, uh, know whether the feds are, uh, wiretapping you is that there would be weird clicks on the phone. Right. Yeah. That happened uh, to me, uh, when I was a younger lawyer, the, I really, I was like, hold on a second. What is this? And it turned out the feds were uh, tapping attorney-client communications. <laughs> <laughs> it's, it's no big deal. Exactly. That's fine. That's fine for the feds to do that. It's it's okay. They've they've never read cats. It's fine. Uh, exactly. <laughs> and it, well, what it was is the way that like that shouldn't have happened if it had, they'd been legally authorized, but they had done it kind of on the cheap. So it wasn't like they actually ended up they they had tapped my client's phone, and we were able to track it. They had physically done it on the phone line. Oh, and so uh, they had actually put the tap on it. Okay. Yes. And you that usually happened at that time period when it wasn't authorized or approved because it would, you know, there are other more sophisticated ways they could it was it was when somebody was doing it on their own accord. Um it was like I had this case of a corrupt IRS agent who did all this crazy illicit surveillance on my client in another case and it turned out the reason he did it wasn't to really nail my client. It was because he loved billing for the overtime of work he wasn't doing. So he figured out why well, hang out and watch somebody's house and try to do all this stuff. I'll claim I did it. I'll just put some illegal cameras and some illegal tap, you know, <laughs> around and then and I can get you know double the overtime because he wanted to live on one of the fancy islands uh, around Seattle. And then oh, yeah. out that, that was the whole. But he was ahead of the surveillance unit for the IRS, which the IRS surveillance unit does surveillance on all the other cases. So it was unbelievable. Uh, speaking of the that'd be. That might be a stream to talk about at some point here. Um, so I just uh, I just went and talked to a tax guy because mm -hmm. I've, I've done my taxes personally every year since I turned 18. Uh, I think I actually did them when I was 16, too, because um, my dad was like, learn how to do your stupid taxes. They're not hard. Well, they weren't hard when I just worked at a movie theater. Um, yeah. But now uh, the way you monetize on social media is you have like 12 different places that all funnel in uh, bits of money. And so you got to do all that. Plus now I have employees. So I hired, I, I, I'm like, okay, I'm not doing this anymore. Uh, and I went to talk to a tax guy and his, his theory is uh, that social media is about to get hit really, or social media earners are about to get hit really hard by the IRS. Um, mm -hmm. And uh, I, I was kind of curious of your thoughts on that since you've, you've done a sufficient amount of tax law and very high profile tax law. And do you think, uh, you think there's some high profile in a completely different way, uh, social media clients you'll be <laughs> soliciting in the near future. I mean, it's that and, and Bitcoin. Those are the two targets. The targets right. are money that doesn't normally get reported. And so mm -hmm. that's why that's why the Biden administration's pushing every kind of reporting requirement known to man. Um, and they, they want to dramatically dollar PayPal thing. Exactly. They're trying to dramatically expand that, make sure all the payers, Stripe, you name it. Uh, report uh, the who who their payees are, uh, as if they're. I mean, the problem is many of these cases they're they're intermediaries. They're not paying for ser PayPal isn't paying for services. So right. how does PayPal know whether X amount of money that came in to PayPal to someone what what it was for? Whether it's reportable yeah. income? That's not a normal 1099 transaction. So they're going to bring in a lot of people that they shouldn't bring in. But the they won't tar the, the the target will be uh, people who make six figures based on their labor. Uh, but not seven figures. No, they won't go after the big people in all likelihood. They like to go right. after middle, you know, uh, mid mid tier labor earners. Um, but yeah, I've no doubt that the people that don't realize it on the Bitcoin front, uh, there's still people out there that don't realize that. There's people who think Bitcoin's anonymous and things like that. They don't understand the third party platforms by which they access and use Bitcoin. I mean, Coinbase has been ratting out people for two years now. Uh, they, right. they decided to go that route as soon as they wanted to go public. The uh, uh, and then, in fact, 
they, they, they were I had clients that had difficulty opening up Coinbase accounts based on excessive due diligence. It wasn't real due diligence. But yeah, that would surprise me that that's that's the goal. Now, mostly it's a control mechanism. I mean, when you can print your own money, you don't really need to tax in the same way anymore. Um, right. You know, but the it's it's control and, and power and uh, they want to make sure they can lock down who they want. You're you're lying again, Robert. I can't believe this. Why would you do this? They're definitely very serious about tackling the thirty trillion dollars worth of debt uh, yes. by 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 nickel and diming uh, and and uh, auditing uh, working class <laughs> working class to upper middle class wages because because by extracting by spending. Uh, tens to hundreds of thousands of dollars in man hours to extract maybe ten thousand dollars in extra taxes from some people. Uh, that's that's how they're going to tackle the debt problem. That's what they're. Well, gonna I mean, do. we're one of the only nations in the world that still criminalize taxes. You know, we're there with like Russia and Iran and those kind of countries. The uh, most countries have moved away from criminalizing tax issues in, in general. I'm arguing this with a judge. I was like, if you really think that high sentences work. Just look at the reality. No matter where the sentencing range has gone, and it's gone up and down over the years, the tax gap has remained almost exactly the same. Uh, it's been about 15% for forever. Yep. Uh, so it, there's no evidence that any of this sort of uh, you know auditing aggression or any of this actually translates much into uh, enhanced tax revenue. I mean, for the most part, it's a money loser. Yeah, what's what's funny about it is, yeah, so it's uh, you're saying 15% and in, in for the chat, you're talking 15% of GDP basically yeah, correct, is, correct. is where it falls. And what they find and is by when the way they that close to the illegal source income percentage of the economy. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, so what, what, what they find is that when they lower taxes, people are more willing to pay those taxes without having their arm twisted. And so yes. the, the amount of receipts that they get uh, goes up the, uh, I guess the, the transparency of those receipts goes up. And then of course, as they increase taxes and they, they squeeze people out of paying, it's like, well, I'm, I don't really feel like paying 40%. So I'll move to a cash-based uh, income or, yep. and, and then the amount that they actually receive per person goes down. And it's, uh, it's, that's why I, I think that they should move away from an income tax anyway. I think it's a, mm -hmm. the wrong way to tax. Uh, I think it should be a service or a service and sales tax. Mm -hmm. And uh, you set it at the percentage of GDP that you want to acquire, and then you get it. I mean, you it's right. basically automatic. If you if you tax if you tax purchasing, you will get the percentage that you want from GDP, and you won't have to have this massive, overwhelming structure. But then, of course, you lose the ability to target your political enemies uh, through yeah. the tax and, and the control mechanism. I mean, people every year rat themselves out. They disclose. I mean, there's a good book called Confessions of a Tax Collector. And the guy goes into detail about how much act, that he knows almost everything about your life through your tax disclosures. So mm -hmm. he knows about your family life. He knows about your home life. He knows about your religious life. He often knows about your political life because people are dumb enough to take donations. As I mean, well, why do you think that thing, little, little, you know, did you, you know, spend X amount on political donations? Certain amount can be deductible. Why do you think that's in there? The yeah. uh, it's and then you add to that now that the 1099s, the W2s, W3s, W4s, W9s, all it's information gathering, massive information mm -hmm. gathering. And then if you throw in a digital currency, because that, that's going to be the future, there's going to be a government-backed digital currency where they can just take a percentage right out of the gate whenever they want, anytime they want. Then they've got ultimate control. And if they don't like your behavior, boom, you don't get to pay your light bill or your food bill. Yeah, it's uh, it's it's crazy. But going back to what you were saying about Coinbase and and any any – sure, there are people who can manage Bitcoin independently and they can they can pay directly to individuals for services and they can keep it relatively anonymous in a way that's the minority of people uh yes. who are really tech savvy and and savvy on crypto and uh they also are at the highest risk because if something happens to their uh wallets or whatever there's no recovery you know they are their own recovery if their computer bricks out and they can't access the data then it's gone um but uh but it as as normal people go in and adoption spreads out, you add third party vendors and third party vendors keep business records for legitimate business purposes. And those are subject to uh, seizure and inspection by the government with far less hurdles. I don't think uh, in some cases they don't even need probable cause for it. They just ask and you have yeah. no expectation well, of privacy. And, and they're in the, you know, like people like Coinbase turn over, everybody uses Coinbase to either get or transfer Bitcoin. Coinbase mm -hmm. gives all those records over to the IRS whenever the IRS has requested them. I mean, they fought it for a, just a little bit, completely capitulated. 
And so no, those, stop. And, no, here you go. Exactly. And the problem is the third party intermediary problem. It's it's the same risk issues with aspects of Bitcoin. It may not be the Bitcoin that has an issue, but whatever third party intermediary you use to either get, keep or store or have it uh, can be a, a source of issues if something happens to that company or entity as has happened throughout Bitcoin's history. Yeah. And it goes it goes back down the line of cases I mentioned earlier. It goes back to cats. And um, I can't remember which one was the banking one, but it's one of the most egregious Supreme Court decisions uh, that damages Fourth Amendment uh, uh, protection from illegal search and seizure and Ninth Amendment privacy is uh, the idea that because you transact with a bank, the bank is then privy to your information. Therefore, it's not private. Even though if the bank were to disclose your information publicly, they would be committing a crime. But, uh, but because you share it with the bank, the bank can then share with the government. And there's nothing you can do about it. You don't even get yeah, to challenge and the government, it. Yeah, the government immunizes the bank. So, I mean, the if it's a certain third-party record keeper in certain contexts that you can file a petition to quash the summonses in the IRS process, that's uh, there's there's advantages to doing it, but it's the, and those petitions are almost never granted. They're often, if you know how to do it right, you will gather information helpful for your client. But very difficult. I mean, they've almost never granted them since the LaSalle Bank case in 1979. And even though the whole predicate of that was was different than the way it's worked because they're not supposed to be doing criminal investigations disguised as civil inquiries. They do it all the time. They assign a technical fraud, technical advisor uh, who's basically helping the revenue agent develop a criminal case against your fourth and fifth amendment rights. Uh, and then they yep. sucker you. I just had a case where they suckered the guy into disclosing all kinds of incriminating information because he thought it would be part of a settlement. And instead it was solely to build a criminal case against them. And uh, yeah, well, they, that's how know, they, uh, that's that's you know they always talk about they got Al Capone through his taxes, but the story is actually much more nefarious than getting him through his taxes. Uh, they they got him on an admission of guilt through his taxes through a proposed settlement uh, of his taxes by his attorney made without his consent, and they said, "Well, nope, that's an admissible party statement." And he's like, "No, it isn't. I didn't make this." The attorney proposed a settlement negotiation with the federal government. And then they, instead of settling it, they took that as an admission, which is crazy. Uh, to and, and the IRS still does that, by the way. They'll yeah. still treat attorney statements in certain contexts as party opponent admissions, uh, which and that's the reason why they have you sign a 2848 power of attorney. And you that's why you always have to be uh, very, very careful with them uh, in terms of the, the, the process. And people think that the IRS is just after money. IRS is not your state tax authority often is you can settle with them often for payment, but not the feds. Feds don't care about the money. You're solely a sin goat to, uh, to terrorize the local community. That's it. The, uh, and the, the amazing thing about that is it's, I think the IRS is probably the only, that's the only area of law of criminal law where that type of, uh, admission would be allowed because oh, if absolutely because in in court uh in in criminal court for murder when you're talking through settlement negotiations those are typically kept confidential even from the court until sentencing sometimes in some states right. but they're kept confidential because the idea is that you can contemplate accepting a plea deal and not have it be used against you as an admission of guilt because right. it's not actually an admission of guilt until you get in court on the record, make the plea and plead to the factual basis for it. Uh, cause otherwise every, they could just offer, Oh, we'll give you a plea deal. And they're like, Oh, okay. That sounds good. And they're like, Nope, that's a party admission confession. You're done. But the IRS does it. And that's, that's it, crazy. And it even gets worse. Almost all IRS publications are actually not legally binding statements of the IRS. They're, yep. they're, yeah, so you can't even use them in, in a uh, trial. Uh, you, you can't use them in a civil tax court case. Uh, almost all of them, they don't are really just propaganda that, you know, they put out. But they say, really, it's on you to figure out that that's not really binding. The IRS also takes the position that unless a court has ruled on your specific tax question in your district, that they can completely ignore precedents from every other federal court in the entire country on, and from the United States tax court in, in many analogous contexts. Uh, and they can just ignore what what if you ignored it would be could be called criminal, but at a minimum frivolous uh, and you wouldn't be allowed to contest it or challenge. I mean, they have so many ludicrous IRS favorable rules that are unique to the IRS. IRS, I mean, the federal I my view is every judge is conflicted. I mean, the IRS keeps special files on every single federal judge in America. So, I mean, yeah. it's, it's a you know problem at multiple levels. No, it's uh, it's it's horrifying to think about uh, the just the mechanism that goes into it and the lack of protection that you have. And the fact that the IRS 
can't tell you what the what its own law means because yes. they they don't even know. Oh, uh, and they'll make they can make recommendations, but they'll tell you specifically those recommendations can't be held against them, and they might be wrong. And you have agents making declarations and determinations of probable cause of criminality who have no background in accounting, no background in tax, no background in criminal law. It's like, yeah, whoa, whoa, it's, whoa, what a crock. It's nuts. Ugh, what a what a disaster. The IRS is depressing. That's why I, I think uh, it would be it would be beneficial to find some solution that gets rid of the IRS. I mean, we, I would prefer to get rid of taxation, but that's a pipe dream in any modern society. They're going you give someone power, they will take it to, to enrich themselves. I mean, that's going to happen. So, uh, so accepting that there will be some level of taxation, a way that cuts out the IRS and cuts out the, the opportunity for people to do things wrong by mistake and be held criminally liable for it. That, that needs to be clamped down. I'm, I'm interested. I didn't know other countries didn't, uh, criminally prosecute tax issues. You're very rare. It's almost what do they do? Civil Just fines. civil judgments. Yep, oh. that's it. I mean, that and makes they find sense. That it actually works better from a deterrence perspective. Well, it's, it, it works better from a deterrence perspective, uh, perspective, and it also gives the person who is uh, liable the opportunity to pay, yes. right? Because if you get a judgment, there are rules of judgment enforcement. They can only collect so much above your income level uh, each month, uh, garnishing your wages or or going after certain property and other properties exempted because you have to be able to live and go and work. Uh, well, if you just go to prison, then you don't get to live and go and work. And then the idea of paying back your tax bill is something that is forever gone. Plus you're a felon now. So when you come out of prison, uh, it's hard to get a job. It's hard to get an apartment. It's hard to get uh, reliable transportation. And, uh, and you'll have this bill looming over your head forever. And you may end up right back in prison again. Uh, oh, exactly. And you, you, it breaks up all your relationships. It breaks up all your community ties, particularly if you serve four years or longer. That's that's considered kind of the norm, the cutoff for you. Four years or more, people just don't come back out and be productive citizens. And it's mm. uh, like the argument I'll make whenever I have a criminal tax sentencing case, if I have a liberal administrative judge uh, you know, or administrative minded pro state judge, because down deep, What's amazing is all these jobs that don't like incarceration and you know are, are on the liberal bandwagon. Now, when it comes to tax, when it comes to tax, <laughs> you've committed a crime against the state. You need to yes. get whacked, double whack, triple whack. All of a sudden, they become vi the vicious liberal authoritarians they really are. Uh, you know the the natural commies they could have been. So the uh, but I'll always go in and I'll make a presentation based on my experience with the Ho Chunk tribe in Wisconsin which was, I, I was a first year law student. Uh, I was a clerk for the summer and I got a paying job, which was hard to come by back then. Um, and uh, thanks to my Native American uh, Indian law professor, who great guy, I mean, hardcore. I lefty. thought you were about to Elizabeth Warren on us right now. <laughs> I, <laughs> yeah. Well, I, by say, way, I, have that, uh, I have a version of that. The guy <laughs> who got to, the, to on law review and moot court and the way he got on law review and moot court was by claiming he was a member of a tribe nobody had ever heard of and he looked smack dab like the most caricature irish person i've ever seen in my life <laughs> and i remember he once came up to me when he found out you know i was doing indian law stuff he was like uh you know how do they uh confirm whether or not you're you're a tribal member do, do you know and i was like oh my god i mean just just confess you know so the uh but i always use the example the shawnahassee tribe <laughs> yeah exactly exactly it was uh, he was from alaska that's how he got away with that <laughs> because a lot of the, you know, there's so many tribes up there are not recognized in a traditional way. So you can pretend to be one. Uh, it was obvious this guy was not one, but he, but he played the affirmative action game. You know, the, uh, it was a smart game to, to, to play the, yeah. but when I uh, got to do that summer, it, it was fascinating. Is they were creating a court system to deal with all of the tribal, non-tribal member conflicts because of the growth of the casino operations. And they wanted a court system that uh, non-tribal members could feel comfortable with. So they wanted to look more like an American court system, but they wanted to blend in tribal traditions with it. But, was right. but you could still choose, elect the tribal elder traditional system. All the tribal members continually uh, chose the tribal elder system. And what was fascinating is little things that I had never thought about were exposed in that process. So like we created a court where the court, you know, the, the, the judge themselves is elevated. Tribal members were enraged at that. They're like, why, sure. why are you elevated? You should be equal with me. You're, you're not right. above me. They, they were just deep. I was like, you know what? I had never thought about that. It's like, when did that come about 
in the design of a courthouse that the judge sits above everybody. Um, or when you know, you're the, a Schrader and you have your your throne, your stately yeah. throne with the 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 emblem of the state on your your padded backrest of your giant like mahogany carved. Uh, <laughs> oh, exactly. A lot of those those Wisconsin courtrooms are that way. I don't know if you saw in the Edgecombe trial. I was I was it was intrigued to see because I haven't been in Milwaukee State Court in about a decade because yeah. all the civil rights cases tells you about the Milwaukee jury pool or how the how both the, the city perceives it. Any civil rights suit gets filed against Milwaukee, they remove it to federal court right away because they want the jury pool from the suburbs. They don't want right. a Milwaukee jury pool. The uh, but the they still have that old like elementary school little uh, thing that you know, has the eight questions for jurors. I, I was I was when I saw the Edgecombe trial, the closing, I was like, oh my god, it's still there. They still got that same little how you know where are you from? Are you married? What do your kids do? What I was like, oh my god, that that was there twenty years ago. But the uh, but what was fascinating was that the tribal tradition was such that it it uh, I usually when I'm in front of these liberal judges, I use the example that the tribal elders, uh, in my view, had a much better system of justice and that our nothing we could do could improve upon it. And part of their reasoning is their whole focus. I was curious as to why this was. And they were very generous with their time with me. Uh, it's because their whole focus is restorative and productive. Their focus sure. is on how can we make the community better by whatever judgment we issue here. And we don't do that in the criminal system. It's it, it's you know it's it's mostly about being punitive or being mean or being political, and we're going to let you go because you're part of a protected political class now. Not how do we make the community a stronger, more productive place? I mean, we have so much creative sentencing that we could do. And I even I, I always offer it in these cases. I had a case where the doctor I was like, the doctor's willing to give half of his time pro bono next ten years, uh, and he'll be able to stay working so he can pay back the tax. Nope, nope, he's got to go to prison for five years even though he's elderly and had no criminal history at all. Well, that uh, was, uh, I had my, my last case that I did was an embezzlement case. mm -hmm. And, uh, by the way, what was, what were the demographics of your client? Uh, white female, um, fifties, I believe. Oh my God. You know, that's the exact profile of an embezzler. I didn't even know. Oh yeah. No, no, it is. I'm like terrified of hiring anybody now that is what, you know, white female in their fifties, uh, because I was, I was like this, this whole, I had a case and the prosecutor, the, the FBI guy went through and he goes, Oh, here's your profile. Boom, boom, boom. And they often are quiet. They kind of feel in, that they've been screwed over and that uh, they're entitled and they deserve recognition. They're not getting, and that's part of the, imbe- but yeah, I was fascinated by that. Yeah. Th- this one wasn't, wasn't that, uh, it was, it was the, it was a different, uh, sort of profile that I've seen where, um, go through life trouble. Uh, mm. they're able to solve a problem, a financial problem, typically, uh, through, through the workplace and then they don't get caught. And so then the next time a problem comes, Mm -hmm. they solve it again. And there's a, there's an initial theory. I can pay it back. I can pay it back. I can do this. I just need to get through this thing. And then there's something else and something else. And then, uh, eventually it becomes almost an habit, right? So, I mean, my client was charged with, um, uh, I think at the end it was 47 felony theft charges. And the way Minnesota does it is they they aggregate all of your theft into six month intervals, and they charge those out as one instance. And so uh, basically the goal is to get above thirty five thousand dollars because then it kicks it way up the severity level um, on each of those. So she was charged with like seven of those and 40 individual transactions of theft. And I mean, the, the number of transactions was way, way higher. I mean, this was seven years. They had all the, had all the records on it. My client pled guilty. So I'm not disclosing anything here. That's uh, all this is, all this is on the record. It's fine. But um, uh, the, with that though, the, the problem that I had is, okay, so these people have, been made less because because my client took their money uh so the idea is that restitution is an alternative form of justice that you would want now my because of covid my client was able to pursue a master's degree while trial was pending had one semester left uh would have finished with a degree in clinical uh therapy or psychology master's degree in either clinical therapy or psychology i don't i don't know exactly but the idea was that uh she was about to be able to get a much better paying job and actually work towards restitution. So we made that argument to the judge, like, Hey, this is the Minnesota sentencing guidelines specifically lay out that restitution is here as an alternative 
to incarceration when the person's no longer a danger. Uh, this is the only criminal act they had had in their entire life. I mean, no traffic violations or anything. Mm -hmm. I think there was one parking ticket and one speeding ticket from like six years ago or something. And that's it. And uh, that was, that was it. And the judge's like, Nope, you're going to prison. I'm like, judge, if you sentence my client to prison, they're never going to be able to pay back any of the restitution, but it didn't, didn't care, you know? And it's like, I mean, I thought, we have this incarceral obsession. I mean, yeah. part of it is uh, judges are authoritarian by nature in my experience. And oh, yeah. so they love to inflict punishment in the name of the state. Uh, I mean, it's really what they drives a lot of them to the bench. But otherwise, I mean, it was the point Foucault made. He was like, you look at the history of criminal justice uh, and the way it's been handled over societies and civilizations over time. And you, and it doesn't make logical sense. In other words, uh, what it, it's not it's a historical this incarceral obsession of the last two centuries. But on top of that, we know we're creating a permanent criminal class. We know it doesn't work. Uh, I mean, think about it. you got some 15 year old kid screws up. You think, well, the solution is we'll send him someplace where there are a bunch of other criminals. One, two, he'll be tortured by those people psychologically uh, and, and physically. And three, he'll get to network. And they're now his only friends and allies are these other criminals. I mean, that that, that doesn't make sense from a societal perspective. Unless, of course, uh, and this was, you know, the genius of, of part of uh, this, you know, Foucault and others was no crime, no police. How do you make people comfortable with the idea of the armed version of the state being present in your neighborhood every single day? You create a permanent yeah. criminal class that you're more scared of. And I think that's the reality of what our justice system is truly about. Yeah, I, I think there's certainly an element to it. Uh, the police power of the state is, I mean, we, we heard it in the, uh, the OSHA mandate stuff. Even coming from the conservative justices, they acknowledge the police power of the state is something that is legitimate, is worthy of upholding and enforcing and, uh, and given deference. And so how... But you can't have a police power if there's nothing to police uh, at the end of the day. Now, obviously, there are certain crimes that should always be policed. But uh, mm -hmm. I, I, the way we do policing now is very different than the origins of the country, right? The police used to be an investigative cleanup unit. Uh, right. They would they would uh, they operated by warrant for arrest uh, very rarely, uh, mainly because of lack of uh, instantaneous communication that we have now. Um, they were not called to the scene as peacekeepers, right? They were called to the scene to figure out what happened, uh, serve warrants and and bring people in after the fact. Now we've we've got this proactive policing thing, and it it, uh, it in some ways has created a separate set. It, it, it's changed the whole mindset of how people interact with their government. Yeah, exactly. Uh, and and I mean, without crime, people's comfort level with aggressive with aggressive policing, would be way lower and yeah. their ability to easily transition from policing crime to policing political dissent to policing vaccine passports, et cetera, would be much harder. Uh, and that's why the, the, the justification for the scale and scope of police activities depends heavily on a permanent criminal class being in existence. Right. Uh, and, and real quick to respond to something that came up in the chat, someone asked, what kind of job would my client have gotten with the embezzlement on the record? Um, not only did my client already have that job uh, and had been working as an intern for those people, but they wrote a letter of recommendation to the judge that uh, and, and these are these are therapists themselves saying we, uh, you know, we recognize what has happened. We have nothing but faith and trust in this person. And uh, we ask we ask for the court's leniency so that they can use their life experience and education to benefit others in the community. So, um, you know, they like we had all the pins. <laughs> we had all the pins to give that uh, to give the judge all the ammo she needed to reduce the sentence. Uh, she was not having it. And um, people around here would with experience with that judge will know exactly why uh, that's that's. I mean, when when the judge can take uh, your client undergoing therapy during two years of uh, two years of trial delay caused entirely by the court and COVID, not by my client. We we did not request any continuances um, until 
there was, I, I had a personal conflict on one date. I think I requested a continuance on, and then we had a continuance in contemplation of plea agreements. Uh, that was it. Um, because the state took so long to give us a plea offer, but two year trial delay entirely because of COVID. So my client went to therapy and the judge used the fact that my client spent two years in therapy against my client as if that was a bad thing, as if that, she said it reeked of privilege. And I was like, what are you talking about? Oh God, it was infuriating. infuriating I had a case like in that courtroom. in uh, Bradley County and the, uh, the, my client was taking, I mean, was, was involved in this uh, big controversy. Uh, I mean, the dr dramatic, traumatic event. The question was whether or not uh, a, a baby had been aborted or had died afterwards and had been buried in the backyard and who was responsible. And so, you know, the uh, mm. uh, it was high profile case. And that was a, this was uh, public interest work when I was working for a public interest law firm in southeast Tennessee. And my client was taking doing therapy and taking uh, medication to right. deal with all of this extreme trauma and other issues that helped lead to it in the first place. And the so the guardian ad litem, the so-called guardian ad litem, was going to go into the court and argue that my client uh, should be seen negatively because she was receiving treatment and because she was receiving medication. And I remember telling the guy, <laughs> I was like, just because we're in Bradley County doesn't mean we have to act like backwards it, idiots. And I probably said some other colorful words, but right. the uh, which he was shocked by. He was shocked that someone would insult the, the great Bradley County, uh, uh, Tennessee. The uh, but it was it was just it's startling uh, the degree to which anything will be used against someone that they dislike for any reason. And mm -hmm. some of the just antiquated notions that uh, that are still present in some of these places. Yeah. And uh, it, it was it's insane. Um, and and just to give the chat a little bit of context, Minnesota is commie. We're a commie state. Make no mistake. We're the, we're the only blue state during Reagan uh, because we had because Walter Mondale was from here. but also. Importantly, because Minnesota is populated by communists, you saw this on jury selection with the Kim Potter trial, commie after commie after commie <laughs> coming up and being questioned, uh, overwhelming uh, loyalty to the state and also very socially progressive. Minnesota is California. We model ourselves after California. Our governor follows Gavin Newsom, probably on Instagram and on OnlyFans, uh, said, and, and he does what Gavin does. So... Um, with that, uh, with that, we have created a, a separate committee of unelected people, uh, you know, uh, professionals and therapists and lawyers that all get together and they wrote up a sentencing guideline book. And it's this hunt, multi hundred page document about how, how Minnesota sentencing guidelines are supposed to be done because they were worried about judges going off on their own and making right. their own decisions. So they didn't want to do that. So they, they put the guidelines there. This is how you're going to sentence people for every type of crime. And if you deviate from this, you have to justify it. And if you don't properly justify the deviation, it's appealable. So uh, to have that, and then you can take direct quotes from those sentencing guidelines and put them into an argument and apply the facts directly to your client and have the judge come up. This is why it was so egregious, uh, egregiously irritating to have the judge uh, rule in the way she did at sentencing for my client was um, she took all of the factors that were supposed to be positive that are written down by our very liberal committee as positive. And she just said, Nope, these are all bad things. <laughs> what the hell? It's my client didn't, my client actually, you know, I mean, there, there were potential aggravating factors there. Uh, embezzlement is an automatic aggravating factor because it's a person exploiting a position of trust. Um, so that's, that's one. Uh, that wasn't discussed as part of the, as part of the consideration for the sentencing. It was, it was entirely all of the good things were just twisted and flipped around. It, oh God, I'm, I'm never going to not be pissed about this case, by the way, just, just so we're clear. Well, never it, not it's be classic. Pissed. I mean, because I mean, with what, uh, in this case that I had with the sentencing, I told my clients beforehand what was going to happen. I was like the, uh, uh, and I threw the judge off with the, with the, uh, it, tribal story because they want to think of themselves as, you know, progressive and they want to think of themselves as rehabilitative and they want to think of themselves as restorative justice. And they, they've been very critical of the theory of general deterrence. And they, they just thought it could never apply in a tax case because those people are, you know, horrible, uh, people that are, have, have, 
offended the state. Uh, they've insulted the king. Uh, and But I told him, I said, well, here's what's going to happen. And then what the judge will do is try to find a way to flip those very things somehow against you uh, mm -hmm. because they have to rationalize in their head why it is they're violating their own principles. Uh, because the, and, and it's what I often tell people. It's like standing doctrine, other stuff like this. I, I had a discussion recently with someone who was like, well, you know, I think st they're, they're applying standing sincerely here. And I was like, uh, uh, in, a, in a case that I'm, I'm involved in, and I was like, the reality is I can find uh, a dozen other cases, probably from that same court, and there are several examples of it, where they've said just the opposite on standing, that the most judges are looking for an excuse for a decision they've already made. They're not like studying the law and studying the facts and then making a conclusion. They draw the conclusion and then look for how to spin the facts and spin the law to get them there. And what drives them crazy is when somebody exposes the fraud that they're really doing. Then they get right. more offended. Then they get more agitated. Then they get more irritated uh, because their hypocrisy is on full display. Yeah. Uh, exposing hypocrisy never goes, never, <laughs> never makes the person feel good about it. Uh, and they, no. if they're in a position of authority, they will use that authority to rail against the exposer. That's, yep. Which is why we have whistleblower protection laws, because the, the authorities are, are quick to clamp down on the whistleblower, uh, which is amazing uh, to me, but um, that's, that's the way it goes. Well, it's like people who say Ed Snowden should have gone through the system. And it's like he just saw his ultimate boss lie before Congress about exactly what he's talking about. What do you think is going to happen to him if he goes through the system? The, you know, the, the, he has to go outside the system. Uh, the only way he would have uh, been, you know, only reason he's still alive, frankly. Oh, yeah. I, I, if Ed, Ed Snowden uh, went in through prison, uh, Epstein, he would have he would have not killed himself very quickly. Well, and I don't know if he would have even he would have gotten been the type to, the... to probably never make it to prison. He just yeah, that's what I was going to say. Someday and not come back. Yeah, that uh, there was there was no there was no proper chain to re to elevate his concerns through. And the thing that drives me crazy is um, he was not only was he right, but the courts have admitted that he was right. That happened finally, I think last year or the year before. They came out and said, "Oh, by the way, everything." That uh, that he mentioned was happening and was unconstitutional. Just you know, he's uh, he exposed illegality of the government, and there are still people who are like, um, but he exposed too much to Glenn Greenwald, and it's like, yeah. but Glenn didn't expose. I mean, there there's some stuff that kind of got was was in with other stuff that might have compromised something somewhere, but they way oversold what was compromised uh, outside of the couple journalists that he talked to. Cause it's like Glenn Greenwald had hundreds of thousands of documents that were not released um, oh, ever yeah. and, and still remain unreleased uh, to this day because he thought that those would be compromising to various uh, armed forces or, or, or special uh, three letter agencies or, or things like that. And uh, they didn't do that. They were, they were very careful to expose as little as possible to show just how ridiculous what the U S government was doing. And they did it. And people still think, uh, I, I mean, I still know people and these are people I've been yelling at for years. Like, no, this guy was an actual legitimate uh, freedom loving hero. Whatever you think about, I mean, he's got, he's got some views I disagree with personally, but what he did was one exceedingly brave and two uh was was entirely american he showed the uh tyranny happening in real time and he was right that's the worst thing it's he was maybe yes. that's his biggest fault is that he was right about it uh, yeah but and, and i think what's underappreciated is that he was a true believer that's why he was shocked by everything he saw and he only went public when he real when he saw clapper lie and he realized the Obama administration that he'd become a he he thought would be different was actually worse. Yeah, it's uh, it's yeah. It's, people always forget that uh, Obama jailed more journalists than any president since I think Lincoln, and prosecuted uh, more whistleblowers than all of his four, 44, 43 predecessors combined. Yeah, the guy was the guy was. Well, he's told people he might have learned his ideas in Indonesia, but he learned his politics in Chicago. <laughs> and you just watch the show, you know, the boss with the uh, with Kramer there, uh, and or you know, Kelsey Grammer, the and you would uh, see understand what the Chicago mindset and mentality is. 
Uh, I mean, this yeah. is a guy who first got elected to office by getting every all of his uh, opponent's signature petition struck because the signature over half of them somehow Matt didn't match. Um, this is this is why he understood signature matches well. And that's why they got away with what they got away with in 2020. Yeah, the uh, the I think it was Rush who always said um, Rush or Glenn Beck. I can't remember, but they always said eventually, someday, history will look back and recognize that the Obama administration was the most corrupt administration in U in uh, maybe in U.S. government history. I mean, maybe as corrupt as Grant. <laughs> Great yeah, I was going to say, we, 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 we got some real dandies back in the day, uh, but in the modern era, no doubt. Right. And uh, and I when he when he first said it, I used to think of it as uh, partisan rhetoric and hyperbole. But as the administration went on, it's like, no, no, he's he's actually right. And and as uh, as time has passed since then, you see just what was going on. And the lingering effects we have, because most of that corruption still stands. It, it's it's stuck around. And it was oh, just yes. fine. He weaponized the government in very unique ways and institutionalized that corruption. So it would last past he was there. It's why I, vote, I bet on him twice uh, because, you know, always bet on the crook. Yeah, <laughs> that's good. Good advice. Uh, OK, I need to start on Super Chats here because um, I know there's a bunch of questions in here for you. Uh, sure. So let, let me let's start rolling through these. Wolfgang Deo says, Vic News, is he finally unbreaded one ball? Uh, no Vic, no Vic news yet. Um, by the way, one of my viewers said that they'd be very interested in your, your take on the Vic Mignogna case. Uh, you know, I, said, I haven't, haven't read any of it. Yeah. So. Yeah. No, I, I didn't think you I've knew much you about describe it. it. And, and, but that's been the scope of it. Yeah. Someday maybe, uh, maybe I can send you some info on it. Of course, sure. I'm just waiting for the freaking appeals court. Which, uh, uh, which Texas court of appeals is it? For? Second, second court of appeals in Texas state court. Is it uh, Dallas? Uh, which city? Tarrant County. Yeah, so Fort Worth. Fort Worth. Fort Worth. Okay. Yeah. That, might, that might not be all bad. Yeah. But, I mean, it's, yeah. it's we, Texas has too many appellate courts. And like, I mean, that's why Alex Jones keeps getting railroaded because Austin elects the appeals court and the trial court. So they're all liberal Democrats that right. hate him. Tarrant County uh, is straight Republican. District courts are all Republican. Appellate courts are all Republican. Uh, his lower court judge was, uh, was John Chupp. And uh, I was not impressed with John Chupp's application of the anti slap law. Uh, I thought, I thought, um, when and that's new in Texas, they've only had it like three or four years. When you ask for a contract, uh, so the tortious interference is part of the claim. When you ask for proof of a contract and they say, well, here are the conventions and here are the dates of the conventions that he had agreed to go to. And here is the amount of money that he was expected to make at these conventions. To me, that's a prima facie showing of the existence of a contract. Mm -hmm. And when you have one contract that not only do you have that, but you also have interference with that contract. And then the uh, contract holder um, re-inviting the person with a newly negotiated contract. And you ask and get testimony about that. And then you say, but what other contracts? And then you dismiss for no, no evidence of a contract at all. It's like, wait, you just talked about a contract for 10 minutes in court and you just dismissed because there was no evidence of the existence of a contract, but we, he actually went to this one. Like this wasn't, this was one where he was initially canceled and then they ended up uh, basically threatening the, the convention and they brought him back and, uh, and the people who threatened to cancel uh, for the tortious interference, they did in fact cancel and induced other people to cancel. It's like all of the elements of tortious interference are there. They're in text messages that are before the court. Of course, like, well, what contract though? It's like this one, dummy. Oh my God. That one. Oh, that judge Chup. Uh, people say judge Chup fucked up. I always say, uh, fuck chupped up. Uh, that's, that's how I go with it. Cause I'm, I'm not impressed with him. Um, but anyway, uh, so maybe when that, if that decision ever comes down, uh, I'll send it to you. Cause it's, it's an interesting case in my opinion. Um, Wolfgang says also you have heard of TCP IP or, uh, FTP, right? Yes. There's also NNTP network news transfer protocol used for news groups, a low tech solution. Uh, okay. A low tech solution to what? Uh, C4 own says, Robert, since you have so many connections in the government, you have to know the answer. Are the penguins getting taller? How close are penguins to the size of men? 
<laughs> I, I've heard something. I saw that somewhere else. I have no idea what that's about. <laughs> well, when you know, you know. Uh, there's there's an allegation out there that the penguins are getting taller and they're, they'll be bigger than men again uh, <laughs> at some point in the future. I am nobody says if Spotify drops Joe Rogan, do you think he has a good tortious interference claim against any slash all the artists that pulled their content? Hmm. Probably not. Cause not nothing they're doing is illegal. And like yeah. I said, I mean, my view is rumble will give him a better deal right now than he got from, he has from Spotify. So, you know, I, I think he underestimates a little bit of his leverage. Yeah. Well, I, I th- this is, uh, I made a tweet about this the other day. Uh, that this is a testing time. Because you've got a group, a class of people who have been entitled and empowered by social media and by basically corporate compliance with social media. And they're testing whether they can make enough noise to force a company to risk uh, a breach of contract claim on a hundred million dollar contract. And I mean, Spotify makes a lot of money, but a hundred million dollars is a lot of money to any company. Um, that's a big contract and you, you don't want to breach that because the amount of, the amount of damage that would be done to Joe Rogan's brand by breaching that contract and saying, well, he's, uh, he's too risky to have on a platform is well in excess of the hundred million dollar price tag. Um, that's a multi hundred million dollar claim. And so, I mean, I think uh, their bigger concern is, is that these are Wall Street firms that are doing this, that Wall Street firms own a lot of these people's music and that they're leveraging that connection to create issues. And if you're Spotify, you're worried that they're going to try to collectively short the stock and 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 drive it down. And, right. the, and Spotify I mean, but, has been suffering. Like people are talking about how oh, Joni Mitchell and Neil Young are, are impacting Spotify stock. It's like Spotify stock has been sliding for months now. Uh, it's, it's not a new thing and it's certainly (laughs) their stock loss is not attributable to the loss of the Neil Young catalog. The Spotify demographic is not pulling up Neil Young songs with massive frequency. I mean, this is not, this is not like, uh, you'd have to get much more contemporary than Neil Young to really impact Spotify's bottom oh, line. Yeah, it'd have to be uh, people Taylor the Taylor Swifts of the world. You would have to get right. those people. And the problem there is those people still own for the most part their licenses. So the it's only these older artists who have sold off their royalties to Wall Street firms is my suspicion because otherwise it may it was totally wacky that Neil Young was involved. I don't think Neil this was Neil Young's idea whatsoever. I think this was the people who owned it uh, own own well, his music. Someone sent me an article from about six months ago from Rolling Stone, and it was it was behind a paywall, so I only got the first bit of it, and it, you didn't need much. About six months ago, Neil Young was complaining about how Spotify doesn't pay him enough. Oh yeah, yeah. So he's he's bitching about the and and Taylor. There's Swift a bunch of musicians that, that have that complaint. Yeah, Taylor Swift did. You know, she railed against Spotify years ago, and actually, I think her. And this is the leverage difference between Neil Young and Taylor Swift. And, and just how much uh, an impact of younger pop music would have versus uh, versus boomer music is that Spotify actually changed their payouts for artists because of Taylor Swift's very public crusade against their payments and saying, basically, she's like, I don't need Spotify and you won't find my music. She pulled it from Spotify, actually, until they paid other artists more. Uh, right. She wasn't negotiating her own contract. She was negotiating. She was leveraging everybody's. And so, um, yeah, it's, uh, it's like, that's what Spotify re- responds to is when there's a, an actual impact and you, you take off, uh, contemporary pop artists that are pulling millions and millions of, of listens per day. Uh, that's, that's who cares. And Neil Young is probably getting less than a hundred thousand song plays per day on Spotify. They don't give a shit about a Neil Young, uh, portfolio. It's just not, it's not well, that valuable to them. Especially, it's not a growth category for subscribers. Same reason advertisers are much more concerned with younger people than older people. Right, but uh, but they're they're testing it because they want to know if they can sink their teeth into Spotify enough to get them to cancel that contract. And Spotify is being tested on: does a contract even matter anymore? And I think that every prominent talker, musician, everybody, they all need to be really considering these exclusivity deals. We should have been, the, the warning shot was Dr. Disrespect. 
I mean, they signed a $10 million plus deal with this guy and they shut Twitch shut him out. What a month later after renewing his contract. And, uh, and we still haven't actually seen that lawsuit come from Dr. Disrespect, though he says it's coming. He's coming up on a statute of limitations issue because I'm guessing he's got two years on that. Uh, not sure what I guess he's going to bring. It but. depends on what jurisdiction. You have some states that have 10 year statute of limitations on breach of contract. Yeah. So it, 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 that does depend. But the lifeline of, uh, of internet personalities isn't a 10 year lifeline when you're, right. when you're snuffed That's out. True. And so uh, he's talked about like, it's the other stuff that has really impacted him. The sponsorships that they had mm -hmm. uh, Twitch has banned him from participating with other Twitch partners on Twitch mm -hmm. streams. So it's like those networks and connections that he built there, those are gone. Uh, all of that stuff. And that's crippled his business. Um, and so, uh, you know, he's the warning shot. Do these exclusivity deals even matter? Are they worth the paper they're written on? Because it's great to say, oh, you're getting a hundred million dollars. You better have a guarantee and an, an advance on that money because uh, uh, right now it's looking like a sports contract where, oh yeah, it's a, it's a big number, but if you get injured yeah. in the first season, you're done and you don't get any of it. Uh, you, you get what you were paid and that's it. So uh, that to me, that's a, the big concern. And the media is full on against Rogan on this. Um, oh yeah, no is, doubt about it. I think what they they don't uh, fully appreciate is that competitors like Rumble can give uh, the Rogans of the world bigger, better deals, and don't care about collab don't care about any of the rest. And because they don't have, they don't rely on other sources of revenue that can be stripped from them, uh, like Spotify. Right. Uh, so it'll, it'll be interesting to see what some of these alternative companies do. I need to talk to rumble. I've got to get set up over there. I'm just so, I'm just so lazy. Um, Wolfgang Deo says shouted in target Brack people got the shortest month unbreaded. Okay. I did not, but it would be hilarious to imagine. No, see me out. Uh, 82 says considering the latest on the less than illustrious, illustrious tales of the gunt saga. Has there been any word on getting Pippa on the show? I have not gotten back. I've not gotten back to her management agency because I want to carefully craft that email. Um, her management agency has concerns over uh, political and, and socially charged content. And that's what we do here. So um, I don't want to compromise anything with Pippa. And, and I want to make sure that the, the management agency is alerted that I won't do anything like this, that we won't have this, this beautiful cat face on uh robert i heard you were asking about this while i was gone yes yes i had not seen that uh just to alleviate your fears this is what's called a gunt cat um this is a front butt so this is a stomach that has swollen to such extraordinary levels that it is bifurcated and actually formed into a front butt and i drew cat whiskers and eyes on it so Okay. Uh, whoops, that's not what I meant to do. <laughs> no one will believe that, but it, I really just clicked the wrong button. So that's what that is. Just so you know, if you ever gotcha. see that, you can just refer to it as a gunt cat and, and everything will be fine. Gotcha. Um, yeah, I, interestingly, uh, the butt is visible in this picture. It's in the back here. It's the negative space. Uh, so this is a very strange body shape, uh, where, yes. where the, the buttock is removed and has actually moved forward into the stomach. <laughs> Uh, but yes, um, oh God, uh, there's so, there's so much backstory there. We don't have time for all of it. Uh, uh, Ak Soa says bill proposed in California. When you register your kid for school, you have to notify the school that there's a gun in your home and whether it's adequately safely stored and whether your child has access to the gun. Yep. Ooh. That's proposed. They got a lot of crazy proposed legislation from California. I mean, they're trying to obviously do the insurance obligation, which is both mostly to to screw working class people uh, yep. and, and to gather information, even more information at the local county level who has a gun. Um, and it's in another pretext to do investigations, uh, criminal cases, you name it. Um, and so and of course, they got all the crazy vaccine mandate legislation they're considering trying to get rid of religious accommodations and just start sticking every drug known to man in your kid. Uh, it's, I mean, I got out of there several years ago. I, I mean, I still have a law practice in California, but I don't live in California. The, uh, and I told all my clients that could get out, get out. And those that did, did those that, uh, waited 
regretted it. Uh, and those that are stuck there are stuck there. Yeah, it's it's wild. And and on that uh, on this specific question, uh, the the gun question, it started in the doctor's office, hmm. and um, that was an immediately immediate red flag for me because even out here in rural Minnesota, we went into the doctor and suddenly there's a question on the little you know your check in questionnaire. And it's like, do you have a gun in the house? I'm like, what the hell does this have to do with my health? I'm not answering this question ever. Uh, and they're going to use and, that Michigan school shooting as the excuse for all this. Oh yeah. Yeah. They're going to, they're going to push that. What do you think about the, uh, the charges against the parents, by the way, I don't think we've talked about that, uh, but that uh, is yeah, a fascinating I, I, case. Unless there's more evidence developed. I, I find it deeply problematic. The, uh, what do you think you know, about the, prosecuting the school? Or the, oh, the now I think there, issues. there's definitely, I mean, I know there's a civil lawsuit now against the school to me. Part of the prosecuting of the parents was to distract from the school. Because it was yeah, to me, it was so like, uh, I was like, this doesn't meet basic protocols. What, how they handled this situation, and and to put that on parents, I get people wanting to be hypercritical of parents and whatnot. Uh, that that's not that's not a practical policy proposal. That will not work long term. It, what the school should have done, they didn't do, and if they had done it, probably nothing happens. The uh, the worst to me, the worst look for the parents is the fact that they ran. They appear apparently knowingly ran i mean i don't know what you do though frankly uh because the writing was on the wall of what was going to happen to them and so then they they bolt the state and uh, they try and get out of the state and try and get uh away from this stuff doesn't work out looks really bad but what no one can predict a school shooting you can't do it you can only do it in hindsight because for every school shooting and every like crazy manifesto and kill list there's a hundred kids with the same stuff written in the same notebooks that don't shoot the school up. Uh, yeah. And I, I'll, I talk about this candidly. I was one of those kids. I had a, a quote unquote kill list on the back of one of my notebooks is every time someone pissed me off, I was like, Oh, this motherfucker is going on the kill list. I was never in my life going to bring a gun to school. I didn't own a gun. I wasn't going to get a gun. I didn't actually want to kill anybody. Um, I, you know, I had, I had my issues interpersonally with people, uh, with certain people like every other kid does in high school, but it was, it was a meme. I mean, it was a meme before like the word meme existed in my vernacular, but, um, that's, that's all it was. Cause it's like, oh yeah, you make a kill list. Uh, it was, it was kind of a joke. And I like, I wrote a poem and read it, <laughs> read it in my creative writing class about the school burning down and me sitting at my desk smiling as it happened. Uh, and, and it, the, it was edgy and it, it freaked a bunch of people out. That was the point of the poem. That was the whole thing to do. So for every kid who was going to shoot someone, there's at least one me who wasn't going to shoot someone, but who had the same type of stuff. And if you, if I had shot someone and they would go back, they go, Oh, the writing was, it was on the wall. You know, everybody should have seen this coming. It's like, no one, no one would have ever guessed because I wasn't actually angry. And, uh, and you know, as much as Ethan Crumbly looks like a creepo in his, uh, in his, um, uh, mug shot, parents don't look at their kids that way. Parents right. don't look at their kids and go, yeah, you know what? Ethan's probably going to go to school and murder nine people tomorrow. That's fine. Exactly. Uh, so I, I, I just, I really hate that case. I hate the idea that they're going to be held liable for something that, uh, is only, is only foreseeable in hindsight. Yep. Um, uh, Wolfgang Deo says, Leighton Goy, uh, blood cancer, homeless people. <laughs> Look, uh, Robert, I just want to let you know, hobos and homeless people are a problem. Why can't I own my own stuff without them making me feel bad about it? Uh, Ru Ruslan says, you are late boomer. Sigurdi says, the body of Christ is unbreaded. The Holy Trinity Wops, bikes, and n words. Amen. A woman and a trans. <laughs> this is all. This is all inside jokes from the UCLA manifesto. I mean, ah, is, I gotcha. So that's the, what the unbreaded the, thing is. Yeah. So uh, Michael Hayes is the guy. He was a lecturer in UCLA in 2020, and someone from UCLA. I told this story on Critical Drinker Show earlier today, but I'll tell it here. Someone emailed me. They're from UCLA, and they said this guy. He had a class and um, he sent homemade pornography to some of his female students um, and 
he gave everybody in the class a C except for the hot chicks who he gave A's to. And so the school went in and edited the grades and gave everybody an A. They're like, yeah, this class turned out to be completely bogus. Everybody gets an A. And then he went back and changed the grades back to what they were. And he and the school went back and forth on this. Uh, so this guy was a weirdo, but he wrote this 800 page manifesto. And uh, Robert, if you had to ballpark, so 800 pages, approximately 400,000 words. Wow. How many uses of the N word would you suggest are in this <laughs> manifesto? If you had to just ballpark it, <laughs> it's 10,386. Wow. Uh, this is a black professor, by the way. So, uh, so it's okay. Uh, but he also really hates the Jews. Um, that that's clear, but it's only about 2,400 use of the, uh, the rhymes with bikes, Jewish slur. Uh, so that's that there's going to be some significant super chats, but yes, the unbreaded thing, uh, on Monday, this guy uploaded over 200 YouTube videos and they're all about most of them about a minute to three minutes long. There are a couple like 15 to 20 minute ones. And his, his account got taken down, but archive.org grabbed a couple of them. And so we were listening to him. And one of them is like, what is, what chat? Can you tell me what the whole line was? It ends with unbreaded, but it's like something on paper unbreaded. And it's like this bad rap beat that he's trying to build. And yep. it, the guy seems like a psychopath. It's beautiful. Uh, if yeah. someone can uh, get touchdown paper unbreaded. And there's like this beat going in the background. He's like, touchdown paper um bread it and he starts getting more and more like lit up and mad oh it's it's beautiful <laughs> it's beautiful uh okay next phoenix orm says check your emails boomer uh pipkin pippa's management has been trying to get a hold of you for collab and apparently you forgot them uh, they've been trying they sent me one email and i have not responded them been trying to get a hold of me yes they they did try i need to respond i know have a shot for the rabbit she did good Godspeed. Yes, Pippa. Pippa was doing great tonight. Debbie O says, come on now. Not all of us who live in Florida are really old. Some of us are just a little old. Silver Coins Go Clink Clink says, the Daily Bread segment is the best thing ever. I've been dying of laughter. Uh, Dr. Squirrel Boy 12 says, thanks for everything you do, Nick. Pipkin Pip Pippa said her management sent you an email. Her stream was fire tonight talking about Ethan Ralph. Tara Rainer says, lost my dad this morning after a full day of bawling and denial. I needed an escape for as long as I can stay up. Please toast to my favorite Canadian dad, an avid whiskey connoisseur, and pray for my mom's friends. Called him Tramp. Uh, okay. Uh, to Tramp. Yes, indeed. Apparently, a consummate gentleman, a fine Canadian, there are very few. And that short list should be honored and exalted. A man who has raised a daughter of character and class, May that legacy live on to the next and the next and the next generation. Cheers to Tramp. Sorry to hear that, Tanner. Very, very sorry. Losing a parent is something no one, well, except for the Menendez brothers, no one wants. Um, Alabaster Scarf says, if I find myself leading an army someday and for strategic victory, I absolutely need a bridge to be destroyed. I know just the man to call, Ethan Ralph. Ponton 21 says this is going exactly the way I predicted already by year three of daily reading. It'll be religion. And Nick, the cult leader when completed living, the word starts, Nick gets charged and ends with law tube covering his trial. So, uh, I've, I've developed a show segment and it's the, the manifesto is 803 pages. So I have a number randomizer and every show I read out of context, one page of the manifesto, but I have to, I have to censor the N words and the bikes and the uh the the asian derogatory slurs i don't i think i'm white enough to not censor wop though i think i can still say wop and that's okay i have i have a wop card uh there's gotta you know, be that's some how they changed some of the uh the, I, I forget which state it was but this came from my indian law professor and he's they were trying to get changed in one of the dakotas i believe that there, there are a lot of schools that had really kind of derive more, you know, not like Washington Redskins, but more derogatory uh, uh, tribal references, Indian references. And sure. they couldn't get any attention. And then they came across this a school 
whose nickname uh, was the Wops, and they had an Italian guy come out like a little guy with a gun, <laughs> the whole thing, and that caused enough outrage that they're able to get changed some of the other uh, monikers. <laughs> Hey, what are you talking about? Exactly. <laughs> Imagine I got high spaghetti. School game. Some random school thought this would be funny. You know, it was like when this the, was it the Stanford band that made fun of the Irish famine at the Notre Dame game. You know, <laughs> people were like, hold on a second, that might be a little far. No, I disagree. They thought it would be funny because it was. <laughs> we gotta lighten up. <laughs> Look. Exactly. Nobody, nobody there was living through the Irish famine. <laughs> well, that's the old Woody Allen joke, right? Time, time plus tragedy equals comedy. Right. Was like I was asking people certain things like after the Kobe Bryant thing, which I won't repeat the joke here because I've been advised it's it's too early. But the... Uh, uh, Wait, the Kobe know, the, Bryant joke? I've made tons of those. You you can repeat it here. It's fine. You're in a safe space. You're yeah, in a safe the, space. You're not in you, safe airspace in Kobe's helicopter, but you're in a safe space here. Exactly. <laughs> well, it's like, I mean, I used to, you know, all the uh, challenger jokes, you know, it was like oh. you could start telling them a few, you know, but you had to wait a little while. I remember when I was actually in Minnesota. My brother used to teach at uh, St. Uh, St. Uh, St. Thomas. Uh, and sure. he lived in the Twin City. He lived in the St. Paul side. And gotcha. I, I read an article, when, and it was in, in the local newspaper. And I just couldn't quit laughing because it was like an honest-to-God Darwin Award winner. Basically, this guy's walking <laughs> up with their, like, he's hiking with his, his family. Yeah. And he turns to his mom, and he says, uh, hey, look, mom. And he was a prank, and he jumped off the side. And he thought he would hit the, you know, the lower level. He, he missed it. He, he, missed it. So he, he right threw up. himself off the ground and missed. He <laughs> learned how to fly. It was like, you know, can you imagine like that on your, 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 your cemetery stone? Look at me, ma. That was his last words. Look at me, ma. <laughs> hey, ma, uh, watch this. <laughs> so I was like, this was a lot. I was like, I've never read a live Darwin Award winner right here. And I just, but I, I told that joke once to uh, an, actually an agent out in L- L.A. And he just stared at me for a while. And he's like, you shouldn't share that with people. <laughs> so I was like, okay, okay. Some people, eh, not their sense of humor. Well, 1987 was the year the Challenger crew became the challenged crew, right? Like yeah. that's. You know, uh, I saw that live as a kid. I'd stay yeah, home from me school too. to watch it. And I was, I was like, uh, what the heck? There was, was that 87? I was I thinking think it was 86. It might've been. Yeah, I think it was 86. I was, I was four, but turning five. But I remember I was. I remember vividly, it's one of those weird things, I guess. I was in my parents' bedroom in Houston, Texas, upstairs, second floor, 8715 Cold Lake is uh, the address, doxed, hashtag. Uh, I was upstairs on their little crappy TV, CRT, probably like a 13, 14-inch screen. And I remember watching, uh, and uh, this is the only, I was five, so I can, or almost five. So I can, rem- I can admit to this. I remember crying watching the challenger explode. Cause I knew what that meant. Um, I was very young, but yeah, it was, uh, it was crazy. And that's cemented Absolutely. in my memory, watching that thing, watching that thing burn up. It's like that. And nine 11 are two of the most early or two of the most visual visceral memory. I remember everything I was doing. I remember most of the challenger thing, just watching on the team is being shocked. And then, of course, you know, 9-11 watching in real – and then I was watching in real time when the second one was hit. And, and the reporter yeah. didn't know it yet. He was still talking while you could see it. I was like, what the heck? I remember I was in uh, I was in my dorm in college, and my dad called me on the phone. Mm. And I was asleep because I had mostly evening and night classes because I'm not a morning person, never have been. And so I was like, oh, I get to pick my own schedule. Everything's at night. And then I just skipped all those classes, which is – there were writing classes who cared. Uh, but – um. Yeah. So I'm sleeping and my dad calls me. It's like nine. So this has all happened at this point, nine central. So the both towers have been hit. He's like, Nick, what? Get up. What? So is there gas in your car? I don't know. <laughs> dad, I'm in college. I don't drive anywhere. I just walk to campus. He's like, get gas in your car, charge your cell phone right now. U.S. is under attack. You got to know what's going on. I'm like, dad, what the hell are you talking about? He's like, turn on your TV. What channel, Dad? Any channel. I'm like, stop yelling at me. I'm I'm sleeping. <laughs> so then I turn it on, and of course they're looping the footage over and over at that point. And uh, I remember watching the plane hit the building. You remember that scene in the Matrix, um, when uh, the helicopter crashes into the building? Yes. And it does that ripple effect on the building before it bursts, and it's like this this cool thing because it's and the way I always interpreted that scene. And I immediately thought of this on 9-11. The way I interpreted that scene is the Matrix was not 
prepared for the idea that a helicopter would hit a building. And so it glitches out before it processes the thing. And that's how I remember watching that plane enter the building and not come out the other side. It was like, it doesn't come out the other side. The building doesn't topple over that way. It just gets sucked in. I was like, that's not what I expected. And that's what I remember most about uh, watching that footage on 9-11. And then uh, yep. all our classes were canceled. So my buddy and I just walked around campus and every TV in every area, in every room was just playing that footage over and over. It was wild. Yeah, but, no doubt. Uh, Lon Baker says, cheers to two of my favorite voices helping spread sane conversations and perspectives. Oh, cheers back to you. Idaho Plumber says, glad you're back, Nick. Been missing your all day streams. Yep. Uh, probably next week, the daytime streams will start back up. Uh, there's a, this trial down in Florida. Have you heard about this one? The, um, uh, the Reeves trial guy, a uh, former, former cop in a movie theater guy throws popcorn at him. He shoots him and kills him. Cool. Um, but uh, claims self-defense in under he's elderly and under Florida law, a battery becomes a felony if the person is over like 65 right. and you get justified legal use of deadly force to prevent a personal felony. So it's just, it seems kind of crazy that someone could throw popcorn. Yeah, it sounds like Blam! Florida. <laughs> Wait, which, which County is he in? Cause his jury uh, pool will be different depending on, but I mean, let me, popcorn let me in see. your face. And so you shoot him. Wow. Yeah, just guns the guy down. Uh, let me see. If I can find it, the guy's name is Curtis Reeves. Uh, let me let me see what if I can. Uh... There were years ago, I was I almost bought property in Dixie County, just because I wanted to say I lived in Dixie County, and it was one of these. You know, it was by the upper part of the Gulf Coast, old school place. Uh, so this trial yeah, was but... eight years ago, or it, this happened eight years ago. It's just now going to trial. Yeah. Uh a Wesley Chapel movie theater. Where the hell is Wesley Chapel? Yeah. Uh, let me let me look that up. Wesley Chapel census designated place in Florida, <laughs> in Pasco County, uh, okay. which is a bit south of Tampa. It looks like. Uh, oh, it's part of the Tampa Bay area metro. Okay. So. There you go. So yeah, yeah, yeah. I guess under the law, maybe he has a fighting chance. That's the place to have it, I would think. Uh, yep. I don't know if you'd want it in Miami. But it depends in, on. In Miami can be such a wild mixture because yeah. it, it's such a diverse place. Certain Miami jurors you definitely would want, but there there's some that would be uh, viable. It's north I mean, of Tampa. Oh shit! Patients I don't. Can I can have a pretty broad view of appropriate yeah, use true. of violence. So, uh, yeah, that's, uh, but it, it's interesting. I think, I think that, uh, Bronca and I will be anchoring those streams. I just have to verify with my schedule. Uh, jury selection starts Monday trial starts Tuesday. Probably, um, I'll invite the law panel, but, uh, I think Bronca and I will, if, if my schedule is good with it, I'll be watching, uh, that and, um, Andrew Bronca, if my schedule is not working, I'd encourage people to go to Andrew's, uh, law of self-defense. Uh, YouTube channel. He'll be live streaming it. If I'm not, if I'm streaming it, he'll be with me. Uh, and so is, is what he said. So I think I'm, I want to do that, but those should start up next week. Marlis says, can you repeat that please? <laughs> that was the, uh, if you get a chance, um, watching the edge comb super cut of, uh, his, his answers that I posted on the channel is, is really a thing of beauty. Yeah. Um, I, I heard that he probably his lawyer had taught him that by time, by doing the whole, can you repeat? Can you clarify that? Yeah. Yeah. It was, uh, it was, it was really bad. The, the, it, that was the problem with it was it is dodge over the place. That was, uh, there was no, no, issue or bickering about what was being done it looked really bad i acted in self-defense can you repeat that i i acted to defend myself like answering questions that didn't need that answer uh oh don't worry guys it was just a hiccup 
on the on the connection don't chill out uh but yeah so um they're like he's like uh okay so after you shot him you picked up your bike and walked down the stairs right which of course that's what he did he picked up his bike and he walked down the stairs which is where he was going nothing innocuous about or nothing uh incriminating about this question at all uh can you repeat that after you shot him you picked up your bike and walked down the stairs i acted in self-defense i know i know you did that we got that but after you acted in self-defense, you picked up your bike and walked down the stairs, right? Can you repeat the question? After you shot him, you picked up your bike and walked down the stairs, right? I acted in self-defense. I, I just, just, we get it. I'm not questioning that. Did we lose Nick? Or is it me? Ah, we lost Nick. Maybe he'll be back. Wait. I wonder if we lost him, lost him, find out. Yeah, <laughs> apparently we lost the movie. Yep. Looks like it's just me for the moment. It looks like we did lose Nick, uh, Nick again. The uh, I'll answer some questions out of the chat. Well, I think I can click on these. Let's see how this works. Hey, Barnes, did you see the Dr. McCory study on if you get the coof, how long your immunity lasts? I think I saw something that said natural immunity lasts a very long time and uh, compared to other immunity. So I, I think I saw what you're referencing. Uh, question to Nick. Nick it's funny. Uh, who are you betting on in the Super Bowl? Probably. Well, here's I'll give you the background. Uh, now, my last 10 Super Bowl bets on the spread have, have won, so I've had good luck in the Super Bowl. The uh, uh, I think for sure I'll probably be betting the over particularly if it keeps dropping uh, into the mid forties uh, when you've had two top 10 rated quarterbacks, according to passer ratings in the, in the super bowl and a total of 50 or less, it has gone over, I think something like 70% of the time, if I recall, right. And then uh, I, all this, I put up at there's some of this, I put up at sportspicks.locals.com. That's where I put up a lot of the sports analysis. Um, and then a, when you have a top 10 quarterback that is an underdog of four or more, they have had a very good record covering the spread and, in fact, have won almost half the time in the Super Bowl since 2005. So those would suggest Bengals plus four and a half, Bengals plus maybe Bengals money line. Ah, there you go. You're back. I don't know what the deal is with these, like, uh, five-minute disconnects. Um, this is this is new and fun. You know what? Uh, so. There's a, are you, have you ever heard of the live streamer DSP dark side Phil? Hmm. No. That's probably for the better. Um, but long story short, uh, dark side Phil would always rail, um, against, uh, his stream because he would be streaming and it would shut down and he'd say, uh, oh, guy, I, I don't know what happened. I, somebody at the ISP is messing with my connection. When I stream, they're messing with my, messing with my stuff. They're, they're shutting it down. And everybody's like, oh, you liar. Of course not. You Whatever. <laughs> I'm on a live stream with this guy named Memology 101. Uh, great YouTube channel. Like two-minute news segments. You've probably, even if you don't know it, you've probably seen a Memology video somewhere. Um, uh, <laughs> Memology's on this live stream <laughs> with, with us. And he's like, yeah, uh, I used to work for, um, uh, who is it? Not Charter, the other C1. What's the? Not Cox. Maybe it was Cox. Uh, oh, you mean the cable companies? Yeah. What? Uh, Probably one of the ones I have. Uh, but yeah, names blinked. Yeah. Anyway, he he worked I, Comcast. He worked for Comcast. Oh, Comcast. Yeah. And he's like, when DSP would stream, I would go in and shut down his internet connection. So it was actually DSP was right. 
It was actually <laughs> happening. And it was Memology who was doing it. It's beautiful. <laughs> so perfect. That's great. So that's probably what's happening to me. Uh, it's probably Malik. I know it's you. I know it's you, you bastard. No, I'm just kidding. Uh, sorry about that disconnect there. Um, okay. Uh, next is kick Jack Smurphy. Oh shit. <laughs> says, please ask Barnes about Jack Murphy. I was surprised he didn't see the signs of him. Maybe being a fed informer. Also Barnes, after you talk about that, please tell Nick and chat about our great hush hush series on locals about your great hush hush series yeah i mean my general take on i mean the my introduction to jack murphy was after he was uh being threatened but being fired from his charter school job right uh because some antifa types had targeted him uh from that and that was a you know referral from mike cernovich and i didn't represent him i just gave him some advice as to how the landscape is going to be and the difficulties there's some dc laws that actually do prohibit political discrimination one of the few jurisdictions that does but you got hurdles with judges and juries in the District of Columbia politically. And he was kind of naive. D.C. and California, right, are basically the only jurisdictions that have that built into their civil rights acts. If I'm not there mistaken. may be something in New York, there's uh, in New York City, but I forget the exact scale of it. I remember looking at it for some prior case, but that we never ended up pursuing it. So that was my basic experience with uh, with Murphy. And then Murphy went into he kind of. Uh, you know, he transitioned, he became friends with that dissident circle around DC at the time, yep. 2015, 2016. So Cassandra Fairbanks, Tim Poole, Will Chamberlain, that Lucian guy, I can't remember anymore. He used to work for Gateway Pundit, uh, that whole crowd. And that's what got him out of it. And then he got into job trouble and he was kind of naive when I talked to him about what the, the landscape was like. Uh, right. then he wrote the book from Democrat, he ended up losing that job. Uh, then he ended up, uh, writing the book from Democrat to deplorable. Then he started a podcast, uh, Jack Murphy live, which 95% mm -hmm. of the, he, uh, platformed people that I thought were good for him to platform and good for anyone yeah. to platform. He introduced the, you know, one of the first people to really promote Darren Beatty, who's now at the Re revolver before he was at the revolver was Jack. Uh, usually the way he asks questions is he always asks respectful questions and investigates people. That's part of why he responds a certain way to hostile questions. And I knew some, and then li much later did the liminal order start and the liminal order was mostly a network association, mutual support group. And so when this whole controversy broke, mostly I had no interest in it. Uh, just, I right. just don't. And in fact, and, and I made clear to people that I wasn't being critical of other people that were being out there. I was critical of some of the people that were in our chat. And what was happening was there was this like little cadre of people who were brigading Viva's chat. Oh uh, yeah. I saw obsessing, it. yeah, exactly. <laughs> obsessing over Jack Murphy, and and Viva was agitated by it because he doesn't care about any of this kind of thing, but he pays yes. attention to the chat. I never pay attention to the chat, the uh, be, because it, the conversation can easily get hijacked and so forth. So, and especially when when I'm doing his show, it's just not convenient for my purposes. I'll pay attention to the locals chat, but but not the YouTube live chat. Sure. Uh, and the so that was my general view, and then you know the I had a little bit of criticism of the quartering just because it was clear to me that people were feeding him a lot of information and he would just repeat. And he would say it with the right caveat. He would say, look, I can't confirm this, so on and so forth. Um, but I was like, some of this is a caricature. You know, it's yeah. completely fair game to criticize Murphy for his articles, for his personal videos, all that jazz. I don't have a problem with that. And They're he clearly <laughs> mishandled it. Going at, well, I mean, going after the quartering, the quartering had fair game to counteract it, went after you, other people. There was well, no... The worst was there he went no after betters or whatever this language was. There was none of that. It was just it was a, yeah. it was somebody who panicked because he screwed up. Now, I mean, oh. he he he's always had a hot fuse. He responded to Viva's questioning when we did a sidebar a year ago with him uh, with with a hot fuse. And he'd reached out to me to help him out legally. And I wasn't interested in, in any of that. But I wasn't interested in these commenters. And I'd get these commenters that would start lecturing me about, oh, you don't know who Jack Murphy is. I'm like, I probably know who Jack Murphy is better than this commenter is. I was like, the, sure. the whole alpha male thing is a very tiny slice of his personality. And I wasn't totally buying Sidney Watson's story. You know, maybe it was straight up, but I thought Star Wars Girl Breakdown. I was like, yeah, OK. Um, but mostly I wanted a Aviva wanted nothing to do with it. And yeah, then that... part two was uh, and then I these people would just follow me around and just <laughs> obsess over it. I'm like, and I've only responded occasionally. I'm like, look, I have a different take on it. Uh, but I like I went out of my way to make clear that, you know, you and Drexel's thing was funny and that was fair game. I had zero yeah. problem with that. I was like, 
but that isn't what Viva and I do. Right? That, that, it's a right. different, different and focus. And these people was, wanted uh... to create drama and then you create conflict and tell them the quartering that I attacked him and uh, uh, other people there. I, I was like, no, I didn't. I was like, in fact, I went out of my way to make clear what I was being critical of, what I wasn't. Um, yeah, in terms that... of my criticism was of commenters and chatters who are obsessed with this guy, who are brigading other people's comment section, trying to railroad, uh, trying to derail conversations because they're obsessed with it. They're obsessed with Jack Murphy. Have at it. You know, obsess over however you want. It, he's clearly fair game for the com for you know stuff he's written and the rest. But I, I don't care. You know, so that, that was my point. Yeah, that was uh, so the people, of course, immediately tell me they're like, ah, oh, Barnes is throwing you under the bus. And so I'm like, OK, I'm like, this motherfucker's throwing me under the bus. I'm going to go. No, I'm just scared. I'm like, OK, I got to go see what happens. So I go and, and watch the clip and I'm like, that's it. That's. I don't think that was throwing me under the bus at all. He said, uh, he said, that's perfect for a show like Nick and Drexel to make fun of and, and have a lot of laughs over. So I was like, whatever, but people thought there was a bunch of drama. And I'm like, I, I mean, I don't think so. I don't no. mind what, uh, it what was, Robert said. So I, I think it was uh, people who, for whatever reason are attached to the Murphy issue, who are trying to extend and continue the drama everywhere. And the, well, it was uh, really funny. <laughs> Oh, like, I gotta I mean, give him credit. It was really the, the, funny. the article was is is just what it is. You can see why he's <laughs> sensitive about it. The uh, uh there, there's you know, I mean that article, the, the the videos, the and the responses. I mean, defaming the quartering is probably dumb. Attacking yeah. other people who are questioning him is probably dumb. Well, and going uh, after know, like whatever, going after Sydney and Elijah was a huge, huge mistake because of course even Sydney's video which um, I could see, you know, Jack framed it his way. She framed it her way. Yeah. That's where you have to leave that issue because oh, once, once he's doing the behind the scenes, like, and, and he tweets to Glenn Beck, he deleted it, but he still did it. It's like, man, you are, you are really, really mishandling this in, in the most catastrophic way of all the people who have made fun of you, Sydney and Elijah, really elijah said basically nothing about it you right. know he's like you know we 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 handled this thing it's fine sydney said i feel like i've kind of been thrown under the bus here's what happened i was never intending to do anything uh and and you can take her word or not take her word whatever you want to do with that but him then then escalating that's like no jack you're just pouring gas on this fire and i mean I'm happy to turn the fire into a roasting pit. That's fine. But for you, buddy, you need to just step back and let this go. Because if you, if he had just, if he had just maybe said again, I'm not going to talk about that right now, or said, look, this is my, this is my perspective. If he would have said at the onset, I wrote an article six years ago. I deleted it because I don't believe it. I think it's damaging to men. I think it's damaging to relationships and I'm about building men up. And that was a time in my life when I was, when I thought I was building myself up, but I, I learned later that I was tearing myself down and I went more back to traditional values. I think if he had done that, he would have diffused it right out. And, uh, and once he, once he deviated from that sort of, I own the thing I wrote, here's why I disagree with it now. Once he did that, he was toast and he just kept, he just kept pushing the toaster button back down to me. Yeah. Well, uh, I mean, he just, he's always had, I mean, part of it is he thinks it's rude to ask any kind of direct question because he does or those kind of questions because he doesn't do it on his own podcast. Right. But I mean, if you get angry at Viva, then you, you really have a, a fuse. You have a problem. And yeah. it was clear there were certain areas he was sensitive about that. He just had a quick fuse and he just has never remedied that and that that's why that blew up the way it did the, yeah, the it, only thing was i wasn't quite buying sydney's story entirely it's like maybe it went certain ways but it's like okay but i but mostly i didn't care so i mean that, well, that, was, yeah. that was most of it and that's the thing jack said his piece on tim pool sydney said her piece on her channel you guys have and sydney's got a big platform six hundred and fifty thousand subscribers i mean it's huge huge youtube channel uh, mm -hmm. and she's got the, you are here podcast, which is new, yep. but it's got a lot of interaction right now. It's a blaze production. It's really well produced and mm -hmm. it's, uh, it's very popular. And, uh, because of that, so you've got, and that was thing. part of my little bit of a suspicion. I was like, put away, if you wanted right. to boost a new podcast, creating this kind of drama that creates a lot of attention, you, you kind of could you. Like, not, 
ask for better timing on that three months in and you have a massive scandal blow up. But yeah. that being said, with with Jack, no, that doesn't mean I think he's in the right. and She's wrong. I'm just pointing right. out that, you know, uh, I, I no, took the story with a little caveat. If if nothing else, if absolutely nothing else, it's extremely fortuitous for the success of their show. Exactly. Like if if I could have gotten that drama within three months of starting my show, I would have yeah. grabbed onto it by its giant food of balls and swung like Tarzan into it. Because of course you of course. want that. Um, the and funny somebody thing is, was feeding that information to the quartering because he didn't know oh, yeah. about Jack Murphy from a hole in the ground. But uh, and and people were feeding me the same stuff, and uh, and the the stuff that I displayed was stuff that was uh, I could verify came from Jack, and and we could laugh at, and and that was that was all we needed to do. But uh, the um, the one thing, uh, shoot, where was I? Where was I going with this? Damn it. I had something. Oh yes. No, the, the one thing I, I completely disagreed with, I'm like, if you think that Viva is going to address this issue in any way, Viva's, uh, and I liked, I liked actually Viva's indignation. <laughs> it was so perfectly him. And I'm like, this is right in character. Viva doesn't care about any of this stuff. He's not, Viva's never commenting on the manosphere. He's not uh, a men's rights activist or anything. Viva cares about freedom and particularly freedom in Canada and these issues. And then he has a curiosity about the contrast between the American legal system and the Canadian legal system. And it, it brings this great balance where he's talking about American issues that have Canadian impact uh, along with you. And it's like, this is, they are not a drama channel. And so I'm, I was laughing at the whole thing because I'm like, poor Viva. I know that he is so uncomfortable right now and it's killing me. <laughs> yeah, and it's, it's because in part he wants to be, he considers responding and respecting the chat, the live chat, yep. part of customer service and part of honoring his audience and so forth. And my thing has always been, particularly YouTube chat, I was like, it can be hijacked if somebody wants to brigade it. Uh, oh, and yeah. I was like, it was clear some of these people that were commenting were not part of the regular audience. And it's I was like, like uh, uh, you know. it's like Twitter, right? Yeah, yeah. 30 people on Twitter can make a disproportionately huge amount of noise. Yes. Well, it because was like the way... all the Fuente stuff. And I kept telling people after the Fuente stuff, I was like, we're going to get brigaded with the chat. Just, just ignore it for a while. It's, it's going to be, mm. you know, the, the little groipers, you know, and the, 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 they think they're part of whatever they're part of. Look, I, the, uh, I, I saw a clip from Fuentes earlier. You don't have to comment on this. I will. Um, uh, he was talking about how he, he wants to see less sex in society and says he's, uh, you know, he's never had sex or whatever. I, I don't think that's true. I don't think that's true. I think, I think there's a cat boy baby growing in Fuentes' uh, uterus right now. So, look, I, I can't prove it. I don't have the ultrasounds. I'm just saying there might be a cat boy baby in Fuentes' uterus. Uh, at the moment, but <laughs> yeah, yeah, I mean, and that, that was should the, stir up some drama for me. That'll be good. <laughs> yeah, there you go, there you go, exactly, exactly. <laughs> but yeah, some of that it, it's, uh, but it was, uh, but yeah, that the way people were trying to make drama out of it is like st I'm still not getting involved. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so okay, so you've talked about that. Um, can you talk about your hush hush series on locals? Oh, sure. Yeah. So what he's referencing is the uh, we do at Viva Barnes Law dot locals dot com. Uh, there's a hush hush series. And the goal of hush hush is to kind of do an alternative historical narrative that questions the institutional narrative about a wide range of topics. The first ever one, of course, was right after January 6th, uh, where, Ooh. you know, told, you know, the story about maybe the moon is this and that. But the bridge of which it's not. But the uh, uh, it was a way to sort of preview the whole series. And bridged into what I thought that January 6th had the hallmarks of uh, insider involvement at some level, whether it was informants or infiltrators, the unusual nature of the security step down that day. I mean, I had talked to Alex about Alex Jones about that about a month before, and I was laying out my concerns with QAnon and how I thought this uh, that this was an effort to entrap, to recreate a militia movement in the United States or to get people to expose themselves so they could be targeted, uh, much like, you know, the you know Operation PatCon that people can now FOIA, you know, go and look at the FOIA disclosures that happened in 2008. Maybe look up Southern Poverty Law Center, informants, Elohim, Oklahoma City, East German spies and Oklahoma City. See how might, that might interlap. But as to take some of those uh, background, but what 
because of what happened on January 6th. Because I remember talking to Jones a month before and I'm laying out all these concerns I have. And Jones is like, well, then January 6th might be a setup. And I was like, eh, yeah. Trump people never really go that crazy. They always say they will, but they don't. And I said, number two, the Capitol is the most secure building in the world. He had 2,500 police just for that building. They, they're going to have, they're probably going to have the National Guard there. They got, I mean, but for that day, we have nine people on staff. <laughs> Exactly. 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 So the, I, you know, what's amazing is I didn't anticipate that Jones to his credit, because he's on hyper paranoia half the time, the, uh, uh, of where he's looking at where, what's the worst possible scenario here was right. But I was the one who talked him out of any concern because I thought, nah, that just, that just can't happen. Uh, and then, you know, the, and then, so once I saw it happen, I was like, this can only happen if the FBI is not doing their job by accident or intentional, whether that by informants and infiltrators being present, a lot of the digital warriors I thought were, were not necessarily real people who are trying to wrap, you know, get people all And the other, I think the mistake the system made is they believed everybody's post on, you know, the Donald Reddit, which was now, you know, now it was the Donald win and now something else. But the, there were a lot of people saying really crazy stuff. And yeah. I think they, they were, I think they hoped it would happen. I think they they wanted some people shot. They wanted some people maybe a potential kidnapping. They wanted this to be the justification for a massive crackdown. And the problem is they didn't realize those keyboard warriors weren't going to do jack. And instead, the only people who wandered in there were just you know grandmas and older people. And I mean, they stayed. I said, what insurrection? Aside from an insurrection that manages to leave your gun at home, what insurrection do you walk between the red lines? I mean, I mean, they're walking like yeah. walking to the Capitol and they're staying between the ropes. There's, I was like, you well, got to be kidding me. And now they're so they're going after uh, they're going after Oath Keepers now, which I mean, I don't give a shit about. Let me be very clear. I, I have no care about the Oath Keepers. If they all went to prison tomorrow it would not affect me in any way. Um, if they if they're innocent, obviously they should be innocent. But if they're guilty, I don't care. OK, um, so but I'm going to say this. They're going after the Oath Keepers guy saying that they had this elaborate plan to bring guns in after they to like boat guns into the to DC after they take the Capitol. I'm like, so you're having an unarmed insurrection, take the Capitol, take Congress, take the executive, which they're in line with somehow overthrowing the government and then bring in guns to hold it. Cause the one, the one big problem that you have with January six is wait. So, insurrection is happening they're overthrowing a government without a gun by laughing and smiling as they poop on nancy pelosi's desk and steal the fucking speaker podium this is the insurrection and how are they going to institute government insurrections the way they tend to occur is either an armed militia group overthrows the local military presence and then takes up a successful defensive position in a fortified building or the military itself insurrects with a coup of some sort and they take over and either depose uh, a, a sitting government or they uh, persist a sitting government beyond its time to be removed. That's how insurrection occurs. You have to have arms because you have to be able to enforce the rule that you've created. Otherwise, these these guys on January 6th, uh, 6th are going to be out by January 7th because they don't have sandwiches for lunch the next day. They're just oh. literally like they looked like tourists. Now, this were was... they stupid? Yes. Uh, did, mm. they, did they potentially violate some trespassing laws? Yes. But insurrection and sedition? I'm, I'm casting X to doubt on this one. Exactly. And what's interesting is that, you know, the story they're trying to script there is what I believe the QAnon was what, what, what QAnon people were communicating. So the QAnon pitch was the insiders are really on your side, but they got a couple of these corrupt actors. So help yep. the insiders. Like I don't, I wouldn't doubt if Babbitt at some level believed that that she was, yeah. uh, you know, the. I mean, there's been different evidence that's come out, so maybe she wasn't even part of that mindset. But I the and I kept trying to tell people like when the idea came about that Trump should invoke certain, you know, martial law and do certain things. I was like, this is this is all insanity and a bad idea at multiple levels, aside from the fact that it would never work. Uh, but the pitch was that the high ranking military was really on Trump's side. This was coming out of the uh, QAnon world and the yeah, high end law enforcement uh... were white hats and you needed to help the white hats clear the black hats. And what's amazing is how have the, is the federal government still not identified QAnon? 
as I mean, the only reason for that at this stage is that QAnon was at some level a government operation, and yeah, it was meant I've, to do what it did. It's been a whole bunch of people in the uh, in the chat. QAnon's a glowy op. Uh, QAnon is FBI. QAnon's Fed. Um, I was talking to. Uh, I saw, well, I've mentioned it on the show, so I'll say it again. And I don't mean this with any disrespect. Um, people can disrespect him all they want on their own. But uh, uh, I was talking to Vox Day on the phone because uh, I've talked to Vox Day a whole lot about the Patreon Owen Benjamin case, which is very interesting um, sort of thing that I think is still going on. But uh, plus, um, unstructured TV is something I think is great. Um and uh, I considered joining it, but uh, I ended up going with locals is not a criticism of unstructured. They've got razor fists over there. People should definitely check it out. But I was talking with Vox and uh, I was in a completely different headspace than him because I was like, yeah, people keep thinking the military is going to come in and reinstate the Trump thing. And I'm like, and I'm and I'm thinking that's crazy. And Vox like, no, I've talked to military guys and I think that's going to happen. I was like, oh, uh, I don't think so, but we'll see. I guess and this is, of course, pre-January 6th that this, this happened. They had been building this for years. And they'd oh, infiltrated yeah. Flynn World. They'd infiltrated a rain. They, the, I was approached by these people pretending to be government insiders right after I started representing Alex Jones. And they said they had this inside information. They knew these people and they had this stuff for me. to, And, and I so I meet with them and I realize th these people are scammers. This is a BS, whatever this is, just complete garbage. Reach out to Jack Posobiec because they pretended that they knew Posobiec. Posobiec's like, yeah, they're, they're complete garbage. And so and that's why Posobiec was warning about QAnon. Jones was warning about QAnon uh, because they saw how this was getting yeah. derailed. This was getting uh, rerouted. Unauthorized TV, not unstructured. My apologies for misspeaking. Uh, unauthorized TV and and genuinely since Razor Fist has eaten a suspension on YouTube completely unjustly by the way you should go check him out on unauthorized TV. Uh, sorry, go on. I I, I wanted to yeah. correct that. The chat was so, but it was. A, I mean, but I mean, you talk about hate. Uh, the the hate I got for for questioning QAnon and then oh, uh, yeah. questioning Lynn Lynn Wood and then questioning <laughs> John Pierce. I, mean, I got so much crap. But then we saw with the the bail proceedings, almost everything I predicted had ultimately come true in one way, shape, or form. Now, credit to Lynn Wood. He had negotiated that deal with me about six months ago where he agreed, hey, look, we got to give Ricky Schroeder his 150 k back, split the rest uh, so that Kyle can have security costs, legal costs, protection costs moving forward. And Wood said, yeah, okay, no problem. The And, uh, you know, they created some, you know, some of his Kyle's handlers, you know, I thought created some unnecessary drama, but – Credit to Lynn Wood for coming back and, and acknowledging that and agreeing with it. But John Pierce's ghost still popped up uh, because of all those creditors that he'd been that, you know, I mean, his misuse of litigation funding is just extraordinary. Um, yeah, and I want to I want to I want to mention something that I, I want to clear up uh, from the Kyle Rittenhouse uh, bail hearing stream that I did. I, I received further information and I'm authorized, say, from Natalie Wisco uh, that. um the nine hundred and twenty-five thousand dollars is going to Kyle. Um, that the yeah. litigation expenses uh, for Kyle were actually paid separate from that. Uh, so Richards and team is not. I didn't know. Oh yeah, that's not I going said, to Richards. He's. Yeah. I think he was going to set up a trust. Yeah, he's holding the, it in his IOLTA. Uh, and the reason for that is, uh, I won't get into it. There's there's collateral why, issues that other people have unfortunately created. So it was advisable that it go through an attorney. That was my initial proposal also to Wood. He he just I said, look, as like if you have disputes with David Hancock, you have disputes with other people around Kyle, let's put an attorney client trust fund and I'll make and make sure it goes to Kyle. So that so Richard stepped up to the plate and said, I'll I'll use my trust account to make sure it goes to Kyle because that the, was a way to resolve Wood's complaints. You know, with uh, so with the Vic case, which we were talking about a little bit earlier, one of the things I did was because people were asking me, I was getting tons of emails and messages. They're like, how can we help this man out? He's been he has been the anchor for us in voice acting for 10, 20 years. Got me through. Uh, I was considering suicide as a kid. He responded to my emails, all this stuff. I want to help him. And I'm like, oh, my God, I have no idea. So I created a GoFundMe. And one of the things that I did very, very intentionally was that GoFundMe didn't go to me, didn't go to Vic. It went into uh, the IOLTA account for the attorney he had selected. Once he had selected them on his own, by the way, I made a referral and that was it. 
I, I said, here's a phone number. They worked that out. There's a whole theory that I somehow puppet mastered all of this stuff. I, I gave him a phone number. He called, they made the deal. Uh, I was not involved in that deal. What I said was, okay, you picked an attorney. I've got a whole bunch of people who want to give you money. He said, I'm not asking for money. I said, I know, but they're asking me to give it to you. Can I give it to you? And here's how I'll do it. I'll send it to an IOLTA account. It's held in trust for you. You don't touch it. I don't touch it. Your attorney touches it. But if he touches it in the wrong way, you have a lawsuit against him. Is that okay? That was okay. That's what we did. And that's why we, that's the beauty of an IOLTA account is it's a constructive trust uh, and it, it protects client funds and gives them a cause of action, which is about the best protection you can get. And it has uh, a disciplinary remedy. You screw yep. that up, you're going to lose your law license. You look at the economic exactly. value of that, it's going to exceed the however much money is in there. Unless you got, you know, the, uh, I once had a, I had a client once, I was resolving some tax matters and he had some people trying to take over his company and I was kind of the hurdle. And for various reasons, he wasn't located within the continental United States at the time. The uh, And they tried, they're like, oh, Barnes is just going to run off with the money. Uh, and in that case, it was, I, I think, you know, it, it might have been eight figures. But I remember telling him, I was like, I'm going to give up my lifetime earnings and be on the lamb for the rest of my life. Uh, for, for I was like, no, that, that's irrational. Oh, that was that was the beautiful thing. So uh, that was the big conspiracy theory is that that Ty and I were going to take the VitGo. That people actually still think that I embezzled and Ty embezzled the GoFundMe money. I'm like, first, um, at the time that I created the GoFundMe, I thought we might raise fifty to sixty thousand dollars. Uh, it, it ended up raising, um, we're now closing in on 300,000. It's been up for two years, you know, so it's, it, it trickles in money every couple of days. Um, uh, but we're closing in on 300,000. So the idea that Ty whose firm represented, uh, a company that was bought by Hormel for $800 million is going to lose his law license and potentially go to prison over half of 300 grand. Like, yeah. And these are lawyers saying this. And it's like, tell me you don't have clients that don't do a law practice without telling me you don't have a law practice because exactly. and I'm sitting here. I'm like, um, I can make this in YouTube advertising money without super chats. I can make this in YouTube advertising money in a couple of years. I'm going to, I'm going to go to prison yeah. for, for 150 grand. I'm sorry. I wouldn't have gone to prison for 150 grand when I was making $28,000 a year at, at uh, Wells Fargo. I mean, there's. Uh, yeah. Well, you know, that, I mean, would. like misuse of trust money can be considered bank fraud under certain circumstances and the yeah. bank can be liable for it. I mean, it's why it's one of the, the safest places you can put money that needs to be in trust for any particular purpose that's possible. Everybody's got an incentive not to screw around with that cash. Yeah. It's, it's crazy, but these, unless of these, course you're Michael Avenatti, but then you don't go through your trust. But see, Michael Avenatti <laughs> To his credit, it was way more than one hundred and fifty thousand dollars, right? Oh, yeah. It's thirty million, wasn't it? Something like that. Oh, was, I mean, I mean, depends. For Stormy Daniels, he he stole like the three hundred grand. <laughs> I mean, he pretended he was yeah. the agent for the book deal. That guy was just stealing in mass. The he somebody asked that question about him in the chat earlier, and I was one of the first people to out him. And in fact, I probably helped facilitate his prosecution because I was dealing with Good. these other cases. And every case I had, I'd tell the local LA prosecutor federal prosecutors like there's no way uh i was like you can't come after my client while michael avenatti's walking around you got a guy that's cheating on every tax known to man and, and you're gonna look at my little client while he's on the view uh they're talking about him running for president you guys look like a joke and that God, they I continued wish embarrassed for i wish he would have run for president before the scandal and the scandal would have hit as the like not an october surprise because it takes a little digestion but maybe september Right. Yep. Cause Oh, that would have been, that would have been the funniest thing. Rockstar, uh, Michael Avenatti coming out, <laughs> just getting absolutely demolished. <laughs> he was, that was my a... prediction early on. I said, Michael Avenatti will be in jail before Donald Trump is not president. And, uh, that, that turned true. That was the, uh, the funny thing with Avenatti and Stormy Daniels specifically was you'll never know if it was true, but it didn't matter when she said, he went forward with the Trump, uh, the Trump lawsuit without consulting me on it and getting my consent. It was like, with all the other stuff building, no one was going to disbelieve poor Stormy Daniels in her bad predicament where she suddenly owed Trump two hundred and sixty thousand dollars in fees. <laughs> it's like, oh well, that she's like, I don't. 
she probably if he didn't write it down, she probably told him expressly to go after Trump because they were definitely going to win or whatever. And then they got blown out on, on anti slap in the fifth circuit, which would later be overturned. That entire ruling is invalid. If, if someone would have appealed it in time, but they didn't. And, uh, and if Avenatti, if Avenatti would have appealed it, he could have gotten, he could have gotten the ruling on that. He could have set precedent that the fifth circuit wouldn't recognize the Texas anti slap. That would come, I think, a year after uh, she lost. And it yeah. could have been him who did it, but he just didn't care enough because at that oh, yeah. time, his whole house of was, cards is crumbling. He didn't know what he was doing. And, and yeah. he, he was always a more of a marketer scam artist than he was a substantive lawyer. Yeah. Well, and, uh, so this goes back to the beginning of the show. That's what I'm getting out of B. Ivory Lamar. Um, mm. the, the thing that yeah. bothers me. He's uh, more of a pitch man. Yeah, he wants to be Ben Crump, and you can right. tell he wants. Well, I mean, who wants wouldn't to be- want to be Ben Crump? But he's got to learn the grift a little better. I mean, Ben Crump is an expert at the grift. Yep, Ben Crump is the best lawyer because he's the lawyer who never shows up in court, never right. has to. He right. he gets uh, ten to hundred, you know, tens of millions, and he's working on those hundred million plus those tens of millions of dollar settlements routinely without ever going to court to, to litigate them. And then yep. all of his court appearances or his typically it's a, it's a subordinates court appearance. All of those are, are as uh, you know, of counsel support for someone who's not actually a party to the particular action. And, um, and it's an amazing grift. And I assume he'll be, if Ben Crump isn't flying around on a plane with a gold plated toilet, he will be soon. B Ivory Lamar wants to do that. And um, that was the, I yeah, watched really Gary. Because it's like, why does a Milwaukee lawyer citing a Florida lawyer? Uh, and the I was, but I recognize. But I was like, okay, that's who he wants to be. He wants to be Willie Gary. And he's oh, been yeah. practicing and imitating and watching. And have you watched uh, he his uh, have his skill ad? level? Say again. Uh, on his website, he has he has a video ad, and um, if you haven't watched it, you should. It's beautiful. It has so many great things about it. First of all, the audio is terrible. It looks really highly produced. And the, the filmography of it certainly is. They used a good camera. They have a good cameraman. Like B. Ivory walks up to like an Escalade and gets in the back and he has a black driver go and get in the front. Of the of course he's he in does. there. He's on the it, phone it, while some guy's driving right, him around. He should have had a white driver. Then, he should have done he would, it. Yeah. Uh, I agree. I agree. Total fail. He should have been, he should have had Miss Daisy driving him. That would have been perfect. Exactly. Uh, yep. But it, it's, it's super overproduced, but then there are these little, little problems. They didn't pay the licensing fee for the, uh, the text graphic that comes in. So it's got like the little, the little copyright watermark on there. It's like, it's oh. 70 bucks, man. Just pay the $70. Yep. <laughs> oh, it's, it's great. Um, wow. angry bell sprout says YouTube won't let me post my super chat, but I did post it in regular chat a few times. I think. C Goody sent me that. So I'll check it out. Vincent Teague. Thanks for the donation. Um, uh, Mandy Karavich says, Nick, you missed my $300 super chat. I want a refund. That's not true. Now you owe me $300 and I'll have Michael Avenetti sue you over it. Vincent Teague says, Barnes, what is your opinion on Camanchos, especially the Liberty series? Also, this is chat's reminder to apply for trade jobs. You will literally become a millionaire if you aren't stupid with your paycheck. Do you know what Camanchos and the Liberty series is, I, I don't know what that is. I do not. Okay. Uh, so I guess you don't have an opinion then. Of course not dodging the question. Um, C Goody says Artemis tree says, sorry, Nick can't super chat on this device. You showed clip of wife at same at incident, same hair, little longer in court. Please read. Will you get with the other device? Ne- or we'll get you with other device next time for super chat sucker punched walk. Uh, okay. So I think, so the wife had at the incident, she had the same hair. Um, yeah, she did. I agree with that, but I think they had her intentionally use that hair. Her hair was very curly and very dark in a picture. This is Theodore Edgecombe in a picture of the wife with, uh, with, uh, Mr. Clearman. Um, she has straighter hair pulled back in a ponytail. She's lighter, and that might be the flash, but uh, make no mistake, it absolutely, if that prosecutor had any sense, 
He said, please show up dark as possible and uh, and with your hair frizzy, not straightened, um, that will that will be beneficial to your husband's legacy. Uh, and, and he should say that that's that's part of his job in conducting that prosecution, in my opinion. Um, OK, Mandy Kravich's. Wait, I read that one. Read that one. Let me get back. Oh, reminds to... me, by the way, of an old early political campaign I was part of where uh, one of our opponents was uh, named Ram Upaluri, something like that. And he was Indian, uh, but this was East Tennessee he was running in. And so when they decided to do the video commercials, they tried to create a really dark background so that people wouldn't know he was Indian. I mean, or wouldn't, <laughs> they wouldn't think of him as too dark for East Tennessee. The uh, sure. but I was amazing is our pollster did this analysis part of this you know pro, you know general professional class bias and they they liked his candidacy style and i and they had him coming out on first and they were saying we should focus on him and i was like there's no way people in east tennessee are voting for a guy whose name they can't spell or pronounce pronunciate ain't happen no nope. uh, and instead they ignored the little rule guy who had like a weird eye thing going on uh whose name was randy button who ran around campaigning by giving people buttons and guess who, <laughs> guess who won on election night? Randy Button kicked the yep. shit out of that guy. Yep. <laughs> How can you not vote for Randy Button? Who's exactly. a yeah, button he gives camping. you a button. He may only have one real eye, but he's, he'll give you a button. Outside of any major metro area, Randy Button wins 10 times out of 10. Exactly. That, it's like, you know, <laughs> I imagine the political strategy meeting. It's like, who's our appointment? Or who's our opponent? Randy Button. Mother. <laughs> exactly. That's what it should have been. They didn't pay any attention to him. And the, you know, I represented one Chattanooga lawyer against another, another Chattanooga lawyer. We ended up spending all our money beating up each other and beating up uh, Upaluri. And Randy Button just walked right in. Had the le smallest budget of all four. But he understood East Tennessee. Uh, in fact, a buddy of mine who's now on the federal bench, he was there and we ran out of beer. And not long after we ran out of votes. And he was like, that's the lesson. Never always have enough beer. Yep. I mean, you got to have it. You got to have it. Uh, I worked on, I only worked on one political campaign and, um, the guy's name was Lee. So, shoot. I'm drawing a blank on his last name. Um, but he was, uh, he was born in Chicago, but raised in Norway. Um, but came back to the States to get his degree. He had an advanced degree in economics. Um, I'm going to think of his name. It's going to be too late, but he changed his name because Vidar was his, Norwegian name. His parents were missionaries from Norway to Chicago. Uh, but uh, so v uh, Lee Byberg, that's his name, Lee Byberg. So um, he changed his name from Vidar to Lee because he's like, I'm in Minnesota. People aren't going to vote for Vidar. They're going to vote for Lee. Uh, and he had a really good chance, but he was going up against Colin Peterson, the chair of the Agriculture Committee. And even if Lee won, he was not going to be chair of the Ag Committee. And so the farmers, the farmers in this area were not going to let Colin Peterson lose. That just wasn't going to happen. I think he's still in office. And that year was the year Colin Peterson or Colin Peterson was supposed to retire the next election. Uh, the Democrats have not let him. He's a pro-life, pro-gun Democrat uh, in a I plus. He, he finally Republican stepped down in 2020 Democrat. after he almost Did lost he? in 2018. Yep. Okay. Because he, yeah, he that, won by like two points in 2018, which was such a big Democratic year. But that part of Minnesota was clearly trending in a different direction. Yeah, we're we're like we're either we were plus three, we may be plus five Republican in this county. It's it's so red. It's the one of the most red counties in Minnesota. But you could not forcefully unseat Colin uh, up until. But yeah, he might have stepped down. I I didn't. He uh, did. He only stepped him. down in 2020. They they still didn't beat him. But he saw the writing on the wall in 2018. Was like I'm not hanging around for this. But uh, he was uh, Lee Byberg was a great candidate. His accent is very thickly Norwegian because he was raised there. Um, that that made things troubling. And he had some really weird sort of strategies. Like he bought a bus and hired a choir. <laughs> they would go around and they would sing like choral hymns all over West Central Minnesota. And it's like. I mean, I kind of get it, Lee, but you're you're losing focus. This guy's got a PhD in economics from the University of Chicago. He took uh, he made so Wilmer is the town I'm next to, and he put Wilmer uh, was producing, I think, 
20% of turkey eggs in America uh, come from Wilmer. So one fifth of all Thanksgiving turkeys, you're welcome, comes from this guy being the CFO of a Christian based uh, turkey breeding company in Wilmer, Minnesota. And so, uh, you know, this is what, this is his legacy. The guy knows policy. He knows, uh, he knows energy. Uh, he was a big proponent of clean nuclear, uh, energy and nuclear power. He had all of the, all of the makings, but he had some weird stuff that happened. And it was like, God, if he, if this guy can't get elected, oh man, it was, it was too bad. He's, he's a really good guy, but, uh, he, he just went, he just went and made millions of dollars being a CFO of some company. Um, Crockett's team says, have you or Barnes ever watched cocaine cowboys, Kings of Miami? Perfect oh, yes. example of corruption among federal prosecutors. The feds even outlawed the defendant's lawyers from taking payments from their own clients. Yeah. And they used the way their lawyers were paid as the ultimate grounds to put them in because they couldn't get them on anything else. I, mean, I think they yeah. tried them three times, only got them on the third times. That's the Cuban ones. Uh, but all the, the whole cocaine cowboy series is great. Yeah, I've seen it. I've never, I've seen it pop up and I've never watched it. Uh, so it, it's legit good stuff. I'll, I'll have oh, to yeah. check it out. They have three different ones. The, 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 I think the current one's on Netflix, but, uh, they, uh, three, all, all three are great. Yeah. I'll, uh, I'll, I'll check it out now that I've got a good endorsement of it. Cause I've seen it. And I'm like, that's an enticing title. I want to watch that, but I don't know if it's going to be stupid and I don't have much time. Um, but yeah, that, well, you that, know how bold those guys were, those guys were bringing in, cocaine on speedboats and they competed in speedboat competition <laughs> <laughs> it's like wow well that is brazen uh oh uh see good you know, one of them fled and it turned out they thought for sure he'd fly international uh like 20 years later it turned out he was living in orlando the whole time <laughs> goodness um oh this is from angry bell sprout he says is it okay to suck on baby boys after they get snipped, even if it is religious tradition, even if cold sore spread is involved. Lots of those stories in the news from time to time. Look, uh, I'm I'm not a fan of that particular tradition, but uh, you know, I, I, just I don't, don't tell people how to live their lives. Don't argue with good logic about it. Because Viva <laughs> was like, that seems kind of excessive. Good logic. I was like, oh, okay, okay. Hey, um, you know, yeah. no, they to, to uh, each their own. I'll let him defend it. I'm not interested in defending it. Um, oh, great, and, great. Uh, I, I have a, I have a rather, I don't know if it's still infamous, but for a time it was an infamous stream where the chat was asking me the, uh, the snip status of my own children. I'm like, stop it. That's, that's inappropriate. I'm not talking about my children's genitalia on YouTube. You fucking weirdos. Cause uh, there, there are people who are like way too into that issue for me. Um, and, uh, and, yeah. and we're not, I'm not, I'm not out here to talk about my own kids. So no, thank you. Um, I think that tradition's a little weird. That's me. Yeah. That's where we'll leave it on that one. Um, the, uh, but I wanted to going back to this cocaine cowboys things and how they, um, how they went after their funding. So two things, one, are you familiar with that gym in New York that was shut down through COVID? They did the GoFundMe. They were selling t-shirts and then the fed seized that money. Uh, and said, nope, you can't use that for your own defense. Do you know whatever happened with that? I, I don't know what ultimately happened with that, but it was the uh, drug drug criminal law opened up yeah. a lot of problems. Fourth Amendment issues, Fifth Amendment issues, Sixth Amendment issues, and they excused it all as drug prosecution and just ignored it. I mean, it was very much a Sicario world in, in the way in which the, those yeah. things happened. And I mean, what they did is they cut off all the lawyers. So I'm not, if you're smart, and you're a drug lawyer, you have that money. It's set up independently in advance. You have the lawyer paid in advance in cash. Um, yeah. Yeah. Cash payment. And, and before you're under indictment, because then that money's not subject to seizure or forfeiture. Uh, but they, uh, yeah, they basically gutted people's ability to defend themselves. And, and it, I always told people it wasn't going to be limited to drug cases. And now it hasn't been, they've extended right. it into you know, white collar fraud cases. I mean, look at the build the wall build a wall he can't uh pay for his defense because they've frozen frozen all the money even though not one donor has complained not one yeah well then uh going back to my my personal uh the embezzlement case one of the things that the judge used against my client was that she had a privately hired attorney and uh and it was like that just again another thing that just reeks of privilege after the hearing the i was still in the courtroom when the judge came in for her next hearing 
And uh, I said, by the way, your honor, um, before I leave, uh, I took the case pro bono and never charged the client a dime. Just so you know. And she, uh, the look on her face was, was good. And that was my, my small victory was I made her feel like a complete asshole for going on the record and, and uh, ridiculing a client for uh, quote unquote, using stolen funds to pay an attorney. It's like, yeah, I, I did the case for free. You bitch. Uh, <laughs> so. Well, you know, when I have judges like that, I try to figure out ways to provoke them to say stupid stuff on the record for appeal. They, yeah. That's the only the only way you can approach some of those judges. Yeah, that's actually worked a surprising number of times. Yeah, it's uh, if if we had had a different approach, we could uh, we did not know that she would be like this. Uh, that was the that was the problem is that uh, I did not know that she would do this. And um, I have since learned that there are particular days where this judge is just and I, I've, I've learned it from uh, correction employees. And like, we know when everybody's having a bad day on their bail hearings, we know that it's, uh, she's having a bad day personally right. and, and everybody gets hosed. And it's like, that is, that is that's improper. the school of legal realism, right? You know, yep. but, uh, what's going to dictate a judge's decision? What he had for breakfast that day. Yep. Uh, the argument she had with her husband that morning, uh, mm -hmm. whatever it is, it's, it's like that. And that is, that is completely wrong, but it's completely real. Yes. Uh, Cobble says, love you, Barnes. You need to be a monthly Ricada guest. When's the next? What are the odds? Uh, Monday, actually. So we're going to start doing those uh, with Richard Barris, the People's Pundit, the first Monday of every month until the fall. And then we'll be doing them every Monday during the you know September, October, the heart of the election. Uh, and he says, also need to get you, Barris, and Barnyard, or Brainerd on Ricadas to talk about 2020 issues. <laughs> Well, those have to be very carefully discussed. Uh, yeah. also, that would have also, to be a rumble conversation. Yeah. Also, also, also a full 2022 election prediction. Yeah. Are you, uh, are you looking forward to the 2022 election season? I think it's going to be a bloodbath. Yeah. Yeah. I think Republicans are going to win. And what I'm most looking forward to is getting a lot more populist elected. People like mm -hmm. J.D. Vance, people like uh, a Adam Laxalt, people like Blake Masters, people like Eric Greitens, people like Joe Kent, people like Patrick Witt. Uh, and, you know, seeing more of them elected because that's what needs to happen if we're going to have a real change be possible. And my other prediction is I think Republicans will take back the Senate and Mitch McConnell will retire in early 2023 because his whole goal is to get a Republican governor in Kentucky so he can get Daniel Cameron appointed to the Senate to replace him because he wants to retire. Who do you think's going to, who do you think they would pick for a majority leader at that point? That, that's going to be, that's where getting some of these young populists with a national potential platform like JD Vance is critical. Cause right now it'd be John Cornyn who is not much of an improvement. Yeah. Yeah. Completely. Completely. Yeah. What do you think of like, uh, who, if you had your ideal pick of Republican senators right now to take Senate majority leader, who would you pick? Josh Hawley. I was going to say, only, would you pick Hawley? Uh, he's the only I, decent I, one. I don't think he's necessarily a natural negotiator or things like that, but he's the best face of the Republican. The other thing is, I was arguing with this with some folks during the Georgia election dispute. I was like, the it's like everybody's still operating in terms of leadership in the House and the Senate. Like the main thing to do is backroom negotiation and getting raising money. The reality is in the modern era where you can crowdfund support, the the presentation they have, this is where Steve Bannon is right when he's pushing Trump for Speaker of the House. Trump will never take it, but is that they're really personifications of the party in the public uh, court of public opinion. And for those purposes, you need to pick those people, not pick just the old school people who look corrupt when you see them on TV. Yeah. Corn, you can't have a corn in up there because uh, yeah. he, he looks. Yeah, he exactly. He looks corrupt. He looks like that old money. Uh, the, 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 as, as, as bad as the stereotype is, but the old white man, Republican, uh, yeah. it'd be the similar thing to appointing Joe Biden as speak uh, as speaker or, uh, as a Senate majority leader. You wouldn't want that look in my opinion. And I was surprised no. that Joe Biden was the nominee because of that with the modern Democrat party. But, um, they, they, they took an undue risk and undue, and it's backfiring on him now putting him oh, up yeah. there. Iowa uh, said, please don't send him. New Hampshire said, please don't send him. Nevada said, please don't send him. <laughs> and then, you know, Clyburn. It's the reason why I think the South Carolina District Court judge will be the nominee 
Uh, it's because of Jim Clyburn. Jim Clyburn saved Biden's bacon in South Carolina. And when Lindsey Graham came in and said he would vote for her, well, that, that, that's it. Now they got their 50 votes. And the reality is Manchin might talk a little bit. No Democrat's going to vote against a black female nominee. No. Uh, the, uh, the, I've only disagreed with Holly on one thing. Um, he, he went heavily after pornography for a little bit. And, uh, and I just, my Liberty, my Liberty sense tingled really quick. And I'm like, uh, I don't, I don't want anything even looking like 1950s Republicanism right now. Uh, it's, it's what you're talking about. Populism is kind of the key. And I think mm -hmm. populism says we don't have time to worry about the, like pornography may be an issue that the public wants to consider right now. Let's just leave that under the auspices of the first amendment and focus on literally every other problem that the country is facing, uh, financially foreign, uh, foreign policy wise, um, immigration wise, let's get those things hammered out before we're worrying about, uh, about this thing that we'll probably lose against in the Supreme court anyway. Yeah. And that, that that's Holly's Catholic past that, that uh, is a recurrent yeah. theme with him. The, uh, Rand Paul would be great, but I don't think they'd ever let that happen. Rand is, I like him, but he's unlikable and he's not, he's so robotic, uh, which is great when he's tearing down Fauci. Right. Yeah. And I love watching him tear down because it's always like, Dr. Fauci, do you, do you remember when you had this up on your website, Dr. Fauci? And it's so methodical and slow and boring and plainly spoken like a text to speech device. It's like, yeah, that's great when you're doing this. But man, could you imagine like negotiating with him would be a terrible thing. I don't think oh, he could yeah. be a deal maker. Uh, and Mitch McConnell is a weird guy, but he could get stuff done when he needed to. Oh, yeah. But, no doubt. Uh, okay. Um, next, Scarlock says, devastation at scales you can't visualize. Tell Dennis to exit the gate at the terminal. What did our prophet Matthew C. Harris mean by this? I don't know. I don't know what he meant by it. Uh, we can only attempt to interpret the sacred texts. Uh, <laughs> Barnes, I should show you one of the pages, but I'd need your permission because there are so many racial slurs on it that if you're if you're uncomfortable with it, I won't do it. But uh, but the, this this manifesto is something else. It is crazy. The gift that keeps on giving. I, I yeah. <laughs> it was, uh, the stream I did the other night was. I was laughing too hard. Um, Bex Fire says, I saw the Challenger launch in school. It only took a New York minute for this joke to make the rounds. Did you hear that the Challenger crew had dandruff? Their head and shoulders were found on the beach. Oh, come on. That's <laughs> oh, rough. Damn it. oh, I remember like, you know, it was the last thing one of, the, one of them said to her, her husband, uh, you know, you feed the dogs, I'll feed the fish. Duck. Oh, <laughs> I remember geez. All they were bad. They were all the bad. worst thing was when I learned that they, you know, they checked afterwards and uh, they believed that they actually died on impact with the water. Ooh. Uh, the the cockpit was intact when it impacted. Wow. And and so had it had just a parachute. It probably they might have survived. Wow. And that's. That was a crazy thing. Um, your hush hush podcast uh on Viva Barnes locals, uh Viva Barnes Law locals com reminds me of um have you do you ever are you familiar with Malcolm Gladwell at all? Oh yes, oh yes. I he's he's kind of weird and squirrely, I know, but I really like his revisionist history podcast. And it takes various events and looks at them just in a different light. It says, okay, let's look at this from a different angle. And that's what, when you were describing the hush hush podcast, it reminded me of that. And then, uh, he has a whole thing about the challenger and how interesting, uh, I don't know if it's on his podcast or if it's in the book, uh, what the dog saw, but he wrote a piece about the challenger and as it relates to nine 11 and the, the idea of like hindsight and looking at these things, uh, but the the signal to noise ratio of all the stuff, because when when you look at 9-11, it's like, oh, they knew they had all this information. It's like they had a whole lot of reports. And the same thing with the Challenger. They knew the O-rings were bad uh, because they tested yellow or whatever. They didn't test red. It's like, but if uh, there, there were like 7,000 other 
sim, sim, uh, systems or elements of the challenger that tested yellow and the O rings were the failure point. It's like, if they stopped every shuttle launch that had a yellow test anywhere, um, none of them would have ever launched in history. And it's, it's uh, really interesting breakdowns of stuff like that. That's what hush That's hush cool. reminded me of. Uh, Taylor cook says, as it would happen, my teacher, the class I was in when the towers, uh, were hit was former CIA. Shit was nuts. Damn. Yeah. Uh, I bet that was, God, I bet that was wild. Did he get on the phone <laughs> immediately? <laughs> it's like, we got, hold on. I got to take, or did he call. keep, uh, keep reading my pet goat? My pet goat. What that's what George goat? W. Bush kept reading after. Oh, been told. that's right. Yeah, I think uh, I thought that was an unfair criticism of Bush. I don't know what he was supposed to do uh, in that moment. I don't. I, I guess I would say, "Sorry, kids, got to go." <laughs> Maybe. Uh, yeah, I. I don't know. Uh, I mean, it depends. Also, I mean, if, if this was part of a plan, then you know, well, different dynamic. That's, a, that's the thing. My um. Uh, my national security law professor was uh, former general counsel for the CIA, uh, John Radson. I don't know if you've ever heard of him. He's, he's great. Uh, but we, we talked about all sorts of stuff with, uh, <laughs> with nine 11, with, um, with the U S drone pro he's a, he's an expert on the drone program. Um, oh, really? But yeah. His, uh, his perspective was great on stuff like that. I'm always interested in what former CIA people think about every, single event that happens of any sort of instance. Oh, that reminds me speaking of uh, what I was going to talk about earlier, the truckers go fund me got shut down. Did you hear about that? Yeah. My understanding is it's just frozen and they're waiting for a procedural posture as to making sure it goes to the people that uh, the funds are intended to. That appears to be GoFundMe's claim. So uh, we'll see. I mean, I mean, the, the protocol is if GoFundMe actually terminates it, they have to give all the money back to the donors, which means GoFundMe's cut is gone. Um, so yeah, not only that. So uh, two things. So I have experience with GoFundMe. Um, if it's what you're saying, then what happens is when you create a third party beneficiary GoFundMe, the third party has to get in contact with GoFundMe and accept the funds because right. that makes sense. They do not let, like, if I created a Canadian trucker GoFundMe, I'm like, yeah, this is for the Canadian truckers, but it's going to my bank account. GoFundMe is potentially committing wire fraud as an accomplice, and they're not going to do that. So they say, okay, well, let's let's find the bank account for the Canadian truckers and do that. So hopefully that's the case. Um, that's my. That's what Viva said he had heard. I hope I hope that's true. I I wasn't sure. I just you know someone mentioned it in the chat yesterday they're like or in my live chat on discord they're like oh by the way gofundme shut it down i'm like oh of course they would yeah. uh because and when i created that gofundme for vic by the way they were not half as woke as they became afterwards i would not use them again personally no. um give send but, go uh, other options yeah i would use give send go especially because the benefit of gofundme is their platform but when you have your own platform like you do or i do or viva uh, or the Canadian truckers, especially when they can, when you can get the message out and the benefit of, of GoFundMe versus anyone else is gone immediately. Um, yep. when you have your own messaging. So, uh, but, but yeah, hopefully it's that first one, but if, if it's the second one, the one, the interesting thing would be if they got everything set up for that third party and then they shut it down for political reasons, likely the money has already been transferred at that point. If they got everything set up, cause GoFundMe right. transfers, daily uh yeah. when when money starts coming in because they're not a bank and they do not want to be a bank because they will get regulated into the ground and half of their practices are very illegal for banking purposes um, yes but uh yeah so um okay that's the big chats um i'm gonna read the rest of the chats but it is really late so if you have to go at any point please uh feel yeah, free I'll to just, let me know i'll probably hop off Okay, I got right an now. early. Uh, I got an early court court here. I, the weird thing about being on West Coast time with, an, with is I have East Coast hearings, Ooh. so they schedule something at like eight thirty in the morning, and that's five thirty my time. Goodness gracious! Well, yeah, get out of here, man. Uh, I really appreciate you coming on. Of course, is there anything you want to say before you before you take off? No, no, this was fantastic. 
Uh, always is brother. And, um, I'll send, uh, the invites to the group for the trial next week. If you have any time you want to pop on, please do. should be interesting. Um, cause I think, I think I'll be covering it. So, uh, Sounds good, otherwise man. next time. See Peace you buddy. Out. Yep. All right, guys, there we go. Uh, always great having Robert Barnes on the show. So much wisdom, so much experience. Uh, and, uh, and, and I always appreciate his input and his perspective. Um, with that, with that daily unbreaded, here it comes. <laughs> okay. Uh, now that he is gone and I, I really, I do not want to force this upon anyone else. Uh, here is, we, we need to do this. Here we go. Unbreaded. So uh, earlier, if you missed it, we did do the randomizer. It was page 448 of the PDF. The PDF page, not the page that's on the actual document. That is what I'm going with. Uh, it is unbreaded, uh, our daily unbreaded. Uh, here we go. And to YouTube, just so you know, to the censors, these are not my words. I do not endorse any of these, we are just reading from the holy text of unbreaded. Without further ado, Asians, shoot all the bikes too. Shoot all the Asian programmers and students and entertainers. Hunt Asians like rats. Hunt all the Asians out. Kill every Ching Chong. Hunt the hunt the Ching Chongs out of colleges. Bomb the auditorium. Bomb the gym. Bomb everything so no one wants to go anywhere ever again. Bomb everything so often, so randomly that nowhere is safe. N-word, kill all the bikes. N-word, kill all the Ching Chong mongoloids. N-word, kill all the red mongoloids. I don't know the difference. N-word, kill all of the bike Ottomans. N-word, kill all the crackers. N-word, kill all the children of other tribes. Kill all their kids. Kill politicians. Don't elect them anymore. Kill all the famous people. Kill everyone who is not an N-word. Kill all the civilians. Kill this civilization. Kill white civilization stop sharing earth stop sharing life don't detonate every bomb plant every knife into a body burn every temple burn every white church shoot every mayor who is asian john mayor i want to very rude very rude him going after john mayor like this shoot all asian politicians oh where were we uh uh, shoot all the Asian store owners and college students, shoot all the Asian business owners and lawyers, shoot all the Asians, shoot all the bikes too, shoot all the Asian programmers and students and entertainers, hunt Asians like rats, hunt all the Asians out. Man, he hates Asians. Kill every Ching Chong, hunt the Ching Chongs out of colleges, bomb the auditorium, bomb the gym, bomb everything so no one wants to go anywhere ever again, bomb everything so often and so randomly that nowhere is safe. N-word, kill all the bikes. N-word, kill all the <laughs> Ching Chong mongoloids. Whole page of this. N word, kill all the red mongoloids. N word, kill all the bike Ottomans. N word, kill all the crackers. N word, kill all the children of other tribes. Kill all their kids. Kill the politicians. Don't elect them anymore. Kill all the famous people. Kill everyone who is not an N word. Kill all the civilians. Kill the civilization. Kill white civilization. Stop sharing earth. Stop sharing life. Detonate every bomb. Plant every knife into a body. Burn every temple. Burn every white church shoot every mayor who is asian shoot all asian politicians shoot all the asian store owners and college students shoot all the asian business owners and lawyers shoot all the asians shoot all the bikes too shoot all the asian programmers and students and entertainers hunt asians like rats hunt all the asians out kill every ching chong hunt the ching chongs out of college bomb the auditorium bomb the gym bomb everything so no one wants to go anywhere ever again bomb everything so often and so randomly that nowhere is safe just <laughs> just a second. Oh boy. Uh here we here we go. We need to N word kill all the bikes. N word kill all the ching chong mongoloids. N word kill all the red mongoloids. N word kill all the bike ottomans. N word kill all the crackers. N word kill all the children of other tribes. 
Kill all the kids. Kill politicians. Don't elect them anymore. Kill all the famous people. Kill everyone who is not an N-word. Kill all the civilians. N-word. Kill the civilization. Kill the white civilization. Stop sharing Earth. Stop sharing life. Detonate every bomb. Plant every knife into a body. Burn every temple. Burn every white church. Shoot every mayor who is Asian. Shoot all Asian politicians. Shoot the, all the Asian store owners and college students. Shoot all the Asian business owners and lawyers. Shoot all the... This has been our daily bread. This has been our daily bread. Unbreaded. <laughs> Let's see. You're going to need to at least redact all the ends unless you want us to not have money for the next three years. <laughs> We'll see. It's after two hours. We'll give it a test. We'll give it a test. Okay. Uh, all right. With that, we needed to get through our daily unbreaded. 11 Bravo Crunchy says, Morning, Nick. Just getting up to start my work day. The reason why your wife likes pugs is because she already has enough nose in her life. Been wanting to say that for weeks, but I'm always sleeping for this live stream. Oh, thank you, 11 Bravo Crunchy. Very much appreciated that personal attack on me. Thank you. Thank you so much. <laughs> Auto tune was a mistake. Everything was a mistake. <laughs> Uh, contrarian says, stop fighting God and go vegetarian. Oh no, no. Uh, digitalis says, since I had coof again, everything with capsaicin tastes bitter, pissing me off since I found my first bottle of rooster sauce in over a year. Yeah. Wait, Sriracha. If you, you haven't had Sriracha in a year, like you can't find it. Uh, Galaxy is press media says, welcome to super lawyer status. Evie Warner's when is the next viewing party on Twitch soon? Evie, maybe this weekend I'll try and do one. I, I really want to get onto Twitch. I've just been this, um, this beginning of the year has been absolutely brutal on my schedule. I'm. Even days when you don't, when I'm not streaming, I am waking up at eight 30 in the morning. So, uh, these, these streams going to three and four, uh, in the morning are really, really tough. So I, I, I apologize. I will, uh, see if I can get a Twitch viewing party maybe tomorrow. Um, the other thing is I keep I keep going long on the streams. Today we had some tech issues that made it go a lot longer. Robert stayed way longer than I thought he would be able to, which I'm very appreciative of. Uh, the tech issues really really put a damper on things, which is a, a damn shame. Um, we did lose three thousand viewers uh, at th at the end. I think we recovered back a thousand, so we lost two thousand live viewers, which is just fucking irritating. But that's the way it goes. Uh, that's the way it goes. Um, but uh, with them going, with them going four hours uh, the past several nights, I've not been able to do a Twitch show. But I will try and get one this weekend. Tomorrow, I'm on three live streams. Two of them are not mine. One of them is mine. If I can, I will do a Twitch uh, because on Saturday I don't have anything in the morning. Thank God. Thank God. Uh, Just Dawn says you should do a find replace with Binger slash N word unbreaded touchdown. Yeah, I, I, I need to do Binger instead of N word. Uh, we got to do Binger. That that's I've got to train my brain to say Binger instead of N word. That's what I got to do. But I'm so cautious against saying the hard R because it'll be clipped. And it'll be used in a nasty way. Um, 
out of context. Uh, and if you if you want to know about context, just ask just ask Sargon about the context. Uh, they don't they don't care. They don't care. So I've been uh, I've been very N word is a is a safe go to, uh, but Binger, I'll try and train my brain for it. Shoot me, Binga. Shoot me, Binga. Um, Phoenix Lord Asterman says, could you play Super Gunt 64 when you're back on Twitch? Um, I don't know. I, I, don't, I am a boomer. I don't know how to emulate Super Gunt 64. I know people are playing it. It's great. I, I probably should because it'd be good. Uh, El Gonzo says, will Barnes be unbreaded? Zars, welcome to Paralegal. Hawaiian STI says, update on Vaughn. Had a procedure yesterday that was he was waiting two weeks for. Ventilator numbers improved. All of the support has been great. Everything helps. Vaughn's COVID relief fund on GoFundMe. Uh, that's great to hear, Hawaiian STI. I really hope uh, Vaughn makes a full recovery. Cameron Nelson says, Corn Pop was a bad dude. The man with no name says, here's your daily bread just for the new segment. You crazy lawyer, Lamau. Uh, Vienna waits for you says the waiter, the water in 17th century Europe and London was so contaminated that they never drank water their entire lives. Just distilled beer, wine, and gin. Uh, very good. They replace water with gin. That's fine. See Goody says black history month should only be three fifths of the month. You stop that. <laughs> stop that. New dislike buttons is inquiry for Nick, Rob and chat. I'm debating uh, in your last live stream with a guy who says life only begins once the child leaves the womb, help shit on him with me. Well, for one, that's a, that's a nonsensical position. Um, life clearly begins prior to the exiting of the womb. There's nothing magical about the cervix that, uh, passing the cervix would somehow instill life into a baby. In fact, some babies, um, are born without ever passing a cervix through a cesarean section, uh, and, and, uh, so where, where does the magic happen that, uh, that a baby leaving a womb suddenly becomes a person, uh, that is, that is nonsense. It's anti-science. It's anti-logic. It's anti-obvious. Uh, it is, it is dumb. It is a dumb position. It's an antiquated position. And it's for people who are in denial. Look, if you're fine with killing babies, just be fine with killing babies. Don't lie to yourself about what they are. It's okay, by the way, for people, I mean, I disagree with it, but people can make principled discussions about the killing of a baby that has, uh, that has not reached a particular age of gestation. The problem with it comes when you say, okay, if you say abortion's fine up to 28 weeks, what about the mom who has a baby at 24 weeks? Does she have four weeks to hammer that baby to death on the table? Can she have the doctor do it? Can she have the doctor? Just come up with a knife and chop up the baby laying on the in the NICU table. Just chop it up with a knife and then take a vacuum cleaner and suck everything into a bag and throw it in the garbage. Can they do that? And if not, why? If not, why? That's the that's the question. If you think that babies can be aborted up to 28 weeks or 40 weeks, then you have to be consistent with it because there's nothing about in the womb versus out of the womb that is medically different. Um, babies still need mom to survive outside the womb because uh, try this. Uh, actually, I don't recommend you try it. But if you leave a baby on a table and don't have mom or dad or someone come and feed the baby and support the baby, they'll, I think they'll die. I don't know. I'm, I, I haven't medically tested this, but I have a hunch. I have a hunch that that will uh, that will be true. Um, so yeah. Uh, so you have to ask these questions. If if they say that uh, oh it's, they only become they only become a life when born, it's like but kids aren't born on the same day, same not even not even the same week, not even the same month of gestation. So how can you say that they they're only children when born? Uh, Ryan the editor says, give Mephisto's movie reviews a shout out for helping inspire the unbreaded blurb. Oh, thank you to Mephisto's movie reviews for that. Very much appreciated. Everyone should check him out. And I need to respond to his email. Bogey34 says, Nick, watch the B. Ivory Cochran plagiarism. I have. I'm not going to play it on stream tonight. 
Silly Sailor says, why does prosecution put so much effort into fighting insanity defenses? What do they care if someone gets locked in a mental hospital or prison? Well, uh, sometimes people are committed to a uh, mental institution and then they are cleared. So they don't want that person to be cleared of their insanity and then sent down because uh, an insanity institutionalization isn't a life sentence. It is a commitment for the duration of the insanity. So if they're in for five years and then suddenly everything comes clear and they're suddenly coherent and aware of what they have done and they've, you know, they, they would never do the other thing because that was only when they were crazy. Then they serve five years instead of life. That's why they have uh, the prosecution fights them. Uh, Andrew Smith says, Nick, I can't believe they let manatee even defend people. I think the best she could do is defend McDonald's. If they were being forced to close, they let the man. <laughs> Wait, are you talking about Chandler's defense? Are you talking about Chandler's defense attorneys? Holy shit. <laughs> Tomorrow's show is going to be amazing. Cars in depth says I ended up getting Berkeley classic laddie for embroidering a uh, yarmuk yarmuks yarmukas yarmukas rich flavorful very smooth and a 100 proof kick join me in Lalhayam uh the Berkeley classic laddie is actually a very good very reasonably priced whiskey uh strong recommend on it um me uh my buddy my buddy almonds and I um, we killed a bottle of Berkeladic, uh, when I was down in Florida and, uh, and got to hang out with him looking forward to the next time I'm down in Florida and, uh, and we can kill another bottle of something. But, uh, the Berkeladic was, uh, was a good meme and it's a good whiskey. Um, okay. Uh, to cars in depth. I don't have a Berkeladic. This is widow Jane, uh, bourbon lime. Not enough phlegm. L'chaim. L'chaim. Skeet Neat says, being a towel player is like admitting that you're a cuck, but they are somehow more dignifying than Ron Soye. Thousand Sons, Master Faction, all the way. Thousand Sons are amazing. I really like Heresy Era Thousand Sons. They're so unfair. Uh, in the books. I don't know how the rules play out in... Uh, in 30 K thousand sons. But I mean, in the books, they're so stupid. They can see the fucking future. It's dumb. Uh, British gridiron films says trucks are for everyone. Our tards, the waffle house killer classic line from today's trial watched on law and crime, but not the same without the law team. And I am maybe going to do some, uh, some watch time of that trial over the weekend. Uh, assuming they don't find him guilty immediately on Friday. I would love to watch some more of it. I think it's, I think it's an interesting case. So hopefully we can do that. Cynthia says you're ignoring the N word, Nick, which I'm sure was said. Uh, why are you sure it was said? I don't, uh, I don't buy it. I don't buy it. I really look. I know horrifically racist people um, who won't say the N-word. The people I know who will say the N-word are black. And even they're hesitant. I, I think online, the N-word gets disproportionate representation. In real life, I really don't think uh, it's anywhere near as prevalent. I don't buy it from the, uh, from the B-Ivory defense team, the, uh, the B-Squad, we'll call them. Uh, I don't, I don't buy it. I think it was a convenient narrative. I think maybe some of the jurors bought it. I don't do. I think the guy said a bunch of other shit. Sure. Could the guy have been racist? Sure. Uh, I don't know. I, I highly doubt. I highly doubt the guy in the room, uh, or in the car with his, with his dark wife is like, let's get that binger. I don't think that happened. Um, very much. Uh, you're going to have to give me more than, than, then Theodore Edgecombe said it. Theodore Edgecombe said it 50 times. Uh, S. Ath says, off topic, did you know the inventory of the hot crazy matrix is a trial lawyer from Tennessee? 
Oh, the inventor. You mean the, not the inventory? Uh, at Ready Trial on Twitter, you should have him on. Oh, maybe. I mean, if he'd be interested. Uh, J.K. Wynn says thoughts on Feds digitizing uh, Second Amendment sales records nationally. California released Second Amendment sales record to third party. By the way, great joke. Pair Bluetooth in friend's car and play manifesto with windows down. Uh, have a BJ dump and run. Yeah, uh, no kidding. You would have to. That that gets your friend killed. That's hilarious. Uh, beautiful. Um, I don't. I don't like the. Here, let me put it this way: No government list is ever good. Period. And I I challenge you to tell me the one government list that is. And when you do, I will say, wrong, you F slur. No government list is good. None. Zero. Uh, Sinch says, so how about that gunt, eh, Nikki? <laughs> Kelly Whiteside says, I had my COVID a year ago and my taste and smell are still not the same. I never know what anything really smells like and everything tastes like dirt. Stop being depressing, Kelly. Uh, oh, crap. 22.22 says, how do I retain your services? When my wife was driving me, she ran right into a house. Please, no one use Good Logic's GPS. <laughs> uh, yeah, I, I well, it depends. The I was talking, uh, I was talking with someone the other day about this. The amount of money I would have to charge to take a case. This is why, by the way, this is why the cases I do take, I do pro bono. Um, the amount of money I would have to charge to compete with YouTube uh, would probably be an unethical amount of money for my level of attorney experience. It's a weird place to be. Um, I appreciate it very much, but it puts me in an awkward place. Cause if someone like I had a friend ask, uh, do you, you know, do you write trust still? And I was like, oh. I mean, I used to do, I used to do trust for like a, a grand. Um, these are, these are 30 page documents that have a bunch of interviews, uh, and, and data coll uh, collation that go into them. Um, they could be a lot longer than 30 days uh, or 30, 30 pages. They could be 60, 70, 100 pages. Depends. Um, I couldn't charge that anymore. <laughs> I can't do it. Uh, I can't do that. So, um, yeah. So my, my thing is I pretty much just not going to charge. If I take another case and the, in the future, it'll be, it'll be pro bono, which is what I've done for the past, uh, all my cases in the past three years have been pro bono. So ever since I started making, uh, making money on YouTube, I said, I'm going to do, I'm going to use YouTube to fund any legal work that I do. Uh, and then that way I don't have to worry about billing someone. Um, Mark Hamilton says in both the Potter and Arbery trial, the judges did nothing to correct or clarify the law, leaving the juries to find the law. Is this typical judge behavior? Why or why not? Um, it's typical in some courts and it's not typical in other courts depends on the judge but judges have a lot of power and a lot of leeway alex scott thompson what about family law it's a pretty simple practice uh i'm not taking any fucking family law cases unless it's someone that i closely personally know and really want to deal with i hate 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 family law um, if you want to see me drink more than anything ever, give me a family law case. No, thank you. Um, and the people, uh, the people who practice family law and have families, they know you can't, it is, it, you can't do it, man. It's so tough. Um, Eugene says, Nick, are you a hundred percent sure it's John, John, China sniffles after effect and not Minnesota using some kind of <laughs> veganification raise on you. No, I'm not. I'm not sure. I'm not sure. Delhi 8079 says was going to donate to you through Streamlabs, but it required I connect an account and give Streamlabs access to see, edit, and permanently delete your YouTube videos, ratings, comments, and captions. Is there a better way to get grifted aside from super chats and Streamlabs? Yes, 
mercatolaw.locals.com is the preferred method. Or if you don't want to do locals, I, I like locals. I think it's great. I prefer locals in general. But if you don't want to do locals, Odyssey. Uh, Odyssey is another way to support that does not have, um, that does not take as much as YouTube. But personally, I'll, I'll say it uh, multiple times here. From a business perspective, uh, I have become okay with the YouTube, uh, how do I say it? With the YouTube cut. I mean, I don't think it should be as high, but I think that YouTube itself have added value through the, the way they do super chats. And this is just coming from years of doing super chats. Now, uh, super chats, they, they lead to more super chats. They just do stream labs. And maybe it's my implementation. I don't know, but looking at other streams, I don't see it. Stream labs do not translate into further stream labs chats the way that super chats chats do. They just, they just, they just work. They have the big fucking highlight. Everybody likes it. They're easy to see. They're easy to follow. And when um, it's, it's crazy, this is weird. You're not supposed to talk about this stuff. So I feel kind of awkward. So forgive me for that. Um, but I, I try to be transparent with, with everything. When a super chat doesn't come in, no other super chats come in. But when super chats start coming in, more and more do. And you can see it happen live during shows. It is weird, but it's it's true. Uh, Streamlabs don't work that way. They just don't. So um, I'm I'm look. I will I will bitch about a bunch of stuff on YouTube. Uh, their super chat feature I think is the best implemented chat feature that that there is across the platforms that I've seen. Uh, maybe Twitch is better. I haven't. I know that other streamers have more uh, Twitch chat success, but for me, super chats have been the most successful thing. I, I don't know why I would argue against it. So buy yourself that Nissan, Nick. I'm not going to buy a Sentra. Terrible, terrible choice. Uh, okay. Um, Angron says, Ralph got BTFO'd by an anime rabbit girl VTuber, and it was glorious. Pippa is love. Pippa is life. Manager also wants to talk to you. So check your email. Um, yes, I will. I will make a point to get back to them. That is, they did send me an email and is entirely on me to respond. That is true. That is true. And Pippa is great and has been wonderful. Uh, nothing is on Pippa at all. Of course, it's all, it's all on my shoulders. Um, but yes, Pippa roasted Ralph. Everybody should check it out because Ralph's been being let's let's get real here. Ralph has been being a catastrophic bitch, uh, complete bitch made, um, pathetic person lately. What he's doing to Gator right now, and I know Gator doesn't care, which is fine. But what he's doing to Gator right now, the guy who has stood by him through all of Ralph's fuck ups. Uh, what he's doing to him is is absolute uh it is it is jack murphy behavior it is jack fucking murphy behavior the only reason that ralph isn't wearing the jack murphy beard is because he doesn't have the testosterone to support it and so uh i say to ralph that's a huge bitch there you go. There you go. It's uh it's it's embarrassing. It's embarrassing, but it's funny. So um it's it's the turd circling the drain, right? And then we'll see where it goes. Great US. Oh shit. I this is for Barnes and I missed it. I apologize. Um uh, Mr. Robert Barnes, one half, which justices are constant or one out of two, which justices are constitutional originalists and not judicial, etc. calling them conservative, liberal, etc., is misleading and not foundational in describing their legal mind or judicial ruling history, given they are supposed to interpret law. Um, he's not here, but I'll say it this way. Uh, Thomas Alito Barrett and some of Gorsuch are originalists 
or maybe textualists. Gorsuch, Kavanaugh are textualists. Probably, uh, well, Gorsuch part textualist, Kavanaugh more textualist. Um, Roberts is uh, bitch made. Um, Breyer is retarded. So is Sotomayor. Uh, Kagan is insane. Is that all of them? There, I think we got them. Uh, and he also says, uh, two out of two. Supposed to be SCOTUS history question. Sorry for the confusion. Mr. Barnes, status on Don Lemon trial. Status on RFK Jr.'s lawsuit. What happened to old lady with chronic illness in Trader Joe's employee tyrants? YouTube mods suck. And all this, only 5% to post Odyssey is heaven. Sorry, I uh, did not get to did not get to that question with Robert Barnes on, but I hope I hope that answer uh, has satisfied you. As far as Don Lemon, RFK Jr., uh, old lady with chronic illness, I don't know. I can send that to Robert and see if he can give me any sort of uh, any sort of instances. Um, Don Baca says, did you happen to see the Facebook lost 26% of its value on Thursday? Makes a dent in Fuckerberg's bank balances. And everybody's. Amaranth lost $300,000 uh, on Facebook, taking that dip. $220 billion erased. Erased. And why? What changed about Facebook? Hey, what's up, Krigler? How you doing, buddy? Uh, we're just, we're just going through things. We're just, we're just going through uh super chats at the time. Hope you're doing well, man. We need to talk again soon. Always love talking to you. Uh, great us says, do not read out loud. Uh, okay. Uh, great us. No, um, I, uh, short answer. I don't do that. Um, people are asking if I had considered, uh, paying a portion of, um, chats to, to Robert, uh, well, um, uh, no, I don't, uh, I don't pay people to be on the show. That is not what, uh, what I do. Um, I go on shows. I don't expect to be paid. Uh, and, and I don't pay people to be on my show. Um, that is kind of the, the social media way other people pay to have people on the show. And that's great and wonderful. Um, I do not, uh, I do not ask for any money for an appearance. And if someone asked me for money for an appearance, um, I would, I'd consider it maybe, but I, I've never done it. I don't know why I would do it. The only person I ever offered to pay, and this is, this is public knowledge was the first time I did a 24 hour stream offered Drexel a percentage of the stream and he turned it down. Uh, he said, of course I will not take it. Uh, so that is, uh, you know, that's, that's the way I don't, I don't know why, um, in this space where we are all, uh, all on social media and all have the ability to, to grow and cross platform that we would, that anybody would do that. Uh, that's, that's mine. Earl gray. <laughs> uh, no, I've not offered to pay Earl gray either. Didn't you give photo chat your super chats? Uh, I donated the, the, the super chats from the photo chat. I actually donated more than the super chats from the photo Chad stream to his GoFundMe. Yes, I did. Uh, but it was not an agreement we worked out in advance. It was not a payment. Someone in the chat brought it up and I was like, I was already going to donate to photo Chad. I hadn't picked an amount yet. That was going to be something I, I did on the fly, but uh, they're like, Hey, why don't you donate the super chat money to photo Chad? And I was like, you know what? That's a good fucking idea. Let's do it. Let's just do it that way. Solves a lot of problems. So, um, but no, I, I typically do not, uh, do anything like that. Um, I'm not, we're not, I don't, it's, it's, we do things differently than the traditional media and that's why we're able to do it by the way. We are, uh, and by the way, what all of the super chats that got donated to, to Nathan, to Bruin, um, pale in comparison to what people actually donated. By the time I donated the super chat money, I think we donated $2,700 from that stream, uh, to his GoFundMe. By the time we did that, um, his, uh, GoFundMe was all, or his gifts and go was already pushing $40,000. So most people donated through there, which I appreciated by the way, because, uh, so YouTube took a cut of that and, um, the IRS 
the IRS takes a cut of those super chats too. Um, I don't think that's a, I don't think that's a write-off for me. Uh, <laughs> so, uh, you know, um, so just so you know, it's a donation. No, this is not DSP. Uh, the IRS, the IRS takes a big bite, a big bite of super chat money. It is taxed as income and, uh, and uh, I am not in a low bracket, so it gets, uh, I have to pay those taxes. In fact, April 15th uh, will be the closest I come to crying in the past 10 years. Uh, well, closest since last April 15th. Uh, next, unbreaded. Um, Great U.S. says, breaking news to no one's surprise, Viva Frey found to be towering over attorney Tom. By the way, how long has he been delusional? Literally a mental illness about being selected for SCOTUS. Oh, that was that was yesterday. Uh, Great U.S. says, don't have to read out loud. Uh, da, 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 da. Okay, gotcha. Um, and also says, uh, it, it was more about the more about the offering super chats to guests. Great U.S. is curious if he knows history of why people use SCOTUS for a Supreme Court instead of uh, SCOTUS OA uh, using first letter of each word or uh, S-C-T-U-S-A. Um, as I learned in shite state school, don't use letters of words such as of the in abbreviation. Thanks in advance because SCOTUS sounds nice. That's how. Uh, Darth Vader says fully automatic, sem fully semi -auto automatic popcorn throwing. Johnny Reb says, have you considered using a nutty neti pot to clear out your sinuses? Uh, I don't have too many sinus issues. A uh, great U S says, holy shite, Batman, Nick, I've never seen you behave on night stream like tonight. Uh, well, you know, I, oh, I, uh, think I, I think that's maybe a, compliment maybe or to my behavior was was a characteristically good look uh i i tend to i tend to go where my guests are malik fox and says is it too late by the way i just i just shit on every guest i have where i make fun of uh balls and stuff uh malik fox and says is it too late for me to plead the fifth no yes Yes, it is. You asshole. I know you shut my internet down. Great US says, God damn it, Nick. Uh, you not check honesty for big tip one here for $25. Yes, there was. I'm sorry. I missed it earlier, but we did get to it. It was uh, the fucking streaming issues were a pain. My bad. Great US says, shit. He did check the big tip on Odyssey. My bad. Well, not at the time that you sent sent it i think it was it was right before uh jay winkler says just the tip g soap says i started compiling a list of states counties etc that do live streams of their circuit courts so far i have texas wisconsin michigan washington georgia cobb county oregon new jersey wyoming i'll be looking for more and email it to you sometime soon hey i appreciate that sword caliber says does the table of contents include this is where the sprinkler joke began i don't know oh <laughs> mephisto's movie review uh, sent that was from yesterday, and Zalcor 07 says, Ow, the edge, ow, the edge. Next, okay, um, breaded. Uh, did we have anything between there? Yes, um, shit. Uh, the engaged few says a country that can make such delicious cigars should not be half starving. Mr. Scott J 87 says book recommendations. Well, um, I am currently reading through American muckraker by, uh, uh American muckraker by James O'Keefe. Um, I would recommend it. I think James O'Keefe is the voice of a current journalistic generation. The only one that matters. I do not see major media as journalists for the most part. Uh, and I think, I think that it is a book so far that is full of wisdom. 
insight and uh, and and good speaking on media. I hope to do a review of the book very soon. I'm behind in reading it, which is my bad, but uh, but I'm working on it. And I would love to interview Mr. O'Keefe about the book. So, um, but I want to do him the courtesy of reading through uh, the book for the interview. I don't want to be one of those, one of those assholes who's like, yeah, I didn't actually read your book, but come talk to me about it. So working on that right now, um, actively in the little free time that I have. So I'm, I'm trying, but, uh, but the problem is every time I sit down to read these damn kids come up like, dad, can you get me X? It's like, Oh my God, it's, it's hard to read when you're interrupted literally every three minutes. Um, but I'm trying. Uh, if you're not into nonfiction, if you're into fiction, I'll recommend specifically, unequivocally, and eternally, Ilium and Olympus by Dan Simmons. Two books, uh, one of the best sci-fi stories ever told. Just read it. It just works. The Ender, seri the Ender series is great. The Bean series from the Ender series is better. Uh, there's also a three-book series by David Gemmel. Troy, Lord of the Silver Bow, Shield of Thunder, and Fall of Kings, um, all by David Gemmel. It's a modern retelling of the Troy series, and it's great. It's a lot of fun. It reminds me a lot of Rome. Uh, two of the characters that are re recurring are Banacles and Calides, and they remind me of Lucius Varanus and Titus Pullo. And uh, very fun. Very fun. There you go. Uh, great, great books. I haven't read Hyperion yet, so I can't recommend it. Personally, I have Hyperion. I haven't read it. Blasphemy, the Bean series is not better than the Ender series, you heathen. I like the Bean series better. Uh, fuck off with that Lusitania garbage. Uh, Lusitania is like Mexico. Build the wall. Keep the fucking piggies out. Get wrecked. Scrubs. Um, Vienna Watts waits for you, says, this is the Apollo 13 of podcast. Great save, though, Nick. Elgonzo 1000 says Nick's bamboozling for more super chats. Mihawk 66 says, how about today's ISIS wag the dog? Yeah, I, I did see that shit. It's uh, the most important ISIS leader. I'm like, ISIS, are, are we still, are we talking about ISIS again? Okay. Hmm. Um, Vox attorney, Professor Chaos, welcome to Paralegal. Vox attorney says, in Washington State, some of the insane can move out to a halfway house after years of good behavior in the institution. State is closing institutions down, though. Yeah, and that's a big problem that we have. Um, the prison system has become the institution system that we used to have because some institutions, some state-run care facilities for the mentally handicapped and insane were nightmare places. They were. That was real. Not all of them, but some of them were absolute disasters. And then they shut them all down. Well, guess what? Now those disasters have been transferred to the prison system and they're not equipped in the same way to deal with some of these people. Uh, look, I like the Ender books, by the way. I like the Ender books, but um, I like the Bean books better. I, just, I love the way that uh, Card writes contemporary near future political military fiction i like it it's a good it's good and on that note read empire by orson scott card great book empire was fantastic um someone asked do i read any of the 40k books i've read a ton of 40k books i've probably read at least uh 50 or 60 of them i have way more than that i'm way behind um okay i love them 40k books however, for the most part, are not well written. It's just that the... Uh...
This fucking internet connection, man. Holy shit. All right. We're back. We're back. Gotta get through. Gotta get through this show. Fucking hell. Uh, so the good thing is, so my kids, my kids contribute to the turbo grift. I don't know if you guys are aware of the turbo grift. Um, the turbo grift is the lo-fi beats to sleep or study to. You familiar with this YouTube channel? Um, which is, uh, a, it's a YouTube channel that has been running the same live stream constantly for like three years. And it has a trillion gajillion fucking views because it's the same stream. It's just been going this whole time. And, um, they have to, ma I, I don't know how much they make money wise. Cause since it's the same stream, there's not like a whole bunch of videos to go back to. It's gotta be infinity. Uh, anyway, the good news about it is when your internet is down and it comes back up, the kids music turns on. So I was, I can't, my, my cell phone doesn't get good reception here in the vault. So I was out of the vault and then the music came on. I'm like, Oh good. The camera's back. So I walked back in. So there you go. Uh, let's finish these chats up. Try clearing your browser history. You degenerate. It's nothing to do with my fucking browser. history, right. Mandy. Uh, Okay, anyway, Brian Nielsen says talk, taking, taking, talking about government snooping. My pediatrician for my newborn said she is required by law to ask if I have guns in my house. Why would she need to know that and report it to the government? It's a good question. Look, I'm not giving you legal advice. I'm not giving you legal advice at all. However, I am not aware of any law that says it's illegal to lie to your doctor about the guns in your house. Fuck. Feds, period. Not applicable says we created the least violent society ever, though. We did. STFU says Robert Foucault is a moral relativist socialist. Uh, Beck's fire says rubs eyes says Barnes on Ricada at 1 a.m. Awesome. This is a while back. Uh, Cynthia says, Nick, if you ban boomer based and all things see goody 564, your chat would be one third less repetitive. Peace and love y'all. Uh, yes, Cynthia. Um, while, uh, while that may be true, while that may be true, let me just address this very, very carefully. Um, only weirdos want less interaction and less speech. I want more speech. I don't care if it's repetitive, say the same fucking thing again and again. That's great. Uh, sir, Vi Vol says our lawyer who art in Minnesota, hallowed be thy nose, thy kingdom come, thy will be notarized in court as it is in heaven. Give us the day, our daily unbreaded. <laughs> Isaac Bowles says, in my opinion, Snowden is both a hero and a filthy idiot commie. That's fair. That's fair. SCFU says, nah, Andrew, punish enemies, employ friends, Jackson. Look, Andrew Jackson wasn't corrupt. The man was correct. <laughs> beat, beat Congress. No one else, no one since Jackson has had the balls to walk into Congress and fucking beat the living shit out of congressmen. And they should. They deserve it. Vienna waits for you says, keep on, keep on, keep on rocking in medical tyranny. Uh, Neil Young dragon slayer says, doctor refused to see me with a face shield. Same one I've had for two years. Now it's the, uh, China mask. I left calling out loud. We fought for your freedom. I wear the Navy veteran patch on my vest. Insanity. It's fucking stupid. Um, someone was talking about, uh, I mentioned my um, allergist. My allergist asked my vac status when I had a meeting with them. Was that today? It was yesterday. Yeah, it was yesterday. Went to the allergist. I mean, that was just that was just a formal question. I'm I'm not throwing anybody under the bus there, but uh, the people at the actual allergy clinic, though they ask about the status, um, 
they they don't agree with the mandatory vax either. Uh, they're like, yeah, uh, don't like the mandate. Like, I'm not opposed to the I'm not opposed to the jab, but don't like the mandate and uh, made them very skeptical. Made them very skeptical. It's my problem with it. So, um, yeah, we remember we are still in we are still in rural Minnesota, and and though companies adopt policies for their insurance purposes and for their uh, their medical care networks, the network providers, uh, the the actual doctors, nurses, and CNAs out here, um, they. They don't, they're, they're normal people. They really are. These are not TikTok nurses. These are actually just real people. Um, what do we got here? Pi is God says, uh, I almost got expelled from school. We had to design community service projects as a joke. I said, I'll do a community service and burn down the school. And some jack off thought I was serious. Uh, the, the closest, the, the most trouble I ever got was a date rape joke. Yeah, that's right. Fuck you. I was making date rape jokes before it was cool. My friend, um, my friend, Dan K. Dan K. Lovingly, uh, idiotically in high school known as Dank, but Dan K. He, uh, we had, we had the best chemistry class on the planet. It was full of just a bunch of shit posters before shit posting was a thing. And, um, and our chemistry teacher uh, had to deal with us and she was the cool teacher. So she couldn't, she couldn't get mad. That was the best part, right? When you've got the cool teacher on campus, um, the one who uh, her neck, she broke her neck. Actually, she was not paralyzed, very fortunate, but she broke her neck at an off school activity because they went to a uh, concert and the, one of the students stage dived and land and hit her in the head and it broke her fucking cer uh, cervical vertebrae or uh, yeah, cervical vertebrae. Uh, and, and she almost was paralyzed from it. So she's like hanging out with kids, taking them to concerts and stuff like that. She was a cool teacher. So she couldn't, she couldn't get mad at all the jokes, which made that class. That class was legendarily fucking fun by the way. Cause we had so many jokes, but we're standing there. And uh, we had lead filings for one of our experiments. I don't remember what the lead filings were for. It's chemistry. Maybe one of you guys knows. Don't remember. Uh, this is this is 23 years ago. So, um, and uh, she says, she makes the statement, by the way, guys, we're dealing with lead here, which means before you eat and use your hands after doing this experiment, you need to wash your hands thoroughly with soap and water because this is lead and it can be very, very dangerous. And my, my man, Dan says, uh, he says, Hey, can I bring some of this home and give it to my sister? Yeah, that's right. And I said, no, Dan, that would be date rape. That was an incest joke a date rape joke and a chemistry joke all in one. This is, this is jokery on levels that should not even be fucking legal. All of the girls in class turned and looked at me like I had just ripped all of their clothes off. It was the fucking, it was a beautiful moment. They were horrified by this the teacher looks at me and she goes i um i i i cannot i cannot let you stay in class after that statement i can't i i cannot do it so you have to go to suspension get get out uh, get out and, and dan says can i go too she goes yeah just get out. <laughs> it was, that was amazing. Oh, it was great. Miss Gelson, you are a true gem. Thank you. Uh, she is a, she's a great teacher. She really was. She is a great teacher. 
uh, very, very, very fun. She always thought, by the way, that I was never working in her class. And I, uh, so the way she did her final was you had a work packet and a pretest. And, uh, if you, how you, if your pretest was good enough, you didn't have to take the final. And she thought that, uh, that I would just, was just fucking around all the time. And I was, I think it's the second highest score on the pretest. And she, she said, I, uh, I underestimated you. I apologize. It's like, that's right. Dad's right. Give me my reparations. Um, okay. Next, uh, Lethal Burrito says, I heard you read Death Sentences Live. That's ballsy, but equally hilarious. Noir777 says, I'm still not dead, by the way, Rackets. That's good. I'm glad you're, I'm glad you're not. Uh, after Miss Gelson, my next chemistry class was Mr. Reinecke. Mr. Reinecke, Reinecke. Uh, and he was, no. Radzik, Radzik, fuck. I'm mixing him up with Starship Troopers, I said, I think. Radson. No, not Radson. That was my, ah, uh, shit. Radzik. Doesn't matter. This guy's like 26, 27. And he sits two girls in the front row, front and center. Um, one of those girls, absolutely gorgeous. Knockout, super personal, by the way. Shout out to Janelle. Uh, always nice, always wonderful, still beautiful. And, uh, and good job, Janelle, on being you. Great person. Uh, other, other person was Lisa. I didn't really know Lisa, but she had giant cans. Which, I mean, that's always a good quality. He sits these two girls right in the front. Right in front. This man never taught a fucking day in his life. Not at all. He didn't teach at all. And how do I know this? Because I sat in the back of the room with my buddies and we played hacky sack we played hacky sack during chemistry class, second semester, senior year of high school. That's all we did. He talked to the tits. And uh, you know what? I guess good for him, you fucking pedophile. Uh, I hope only that he got whatever was deserved. He did not talk to anybody else in class. He just sat in the two girls. They may have been 18 at the time, or they may have been 17. I don't know. But he sat them down. All I know is that they were legal age for me and they were wildly attractive and it was great. Uh, but he sat down and just sat at the desk and talked to those two girls the entire, the entire fucking semester. That's all he did. If they weren't 18, they were really close. Still not appropriate, by the way. He is a teacher. They were students. Uh, but he was, he was young. He was young. I don't know. Uh, <laughs> I don't know if he ever got in trouble. Uh, not, not here to out him 20 years later. Uh, just, just thought it was funny. I didn't care. We were playing hacky sack. We were turning on Bunsen burners at random too, but mostly hacky sack. Ryan Gordon says, are we ever going to get info on Vic's case? Don't know. Don't know. Uh, Ryoji Mata says, Hey, Nick had another PB and J with the jelly on top of the peanut butter. Still the superior method. You know what? Ryoji, fuck you get banned. RMRV says, is Barnes married? I have no idea. I, I don't know if I've ever asked. I might've asked him on the first stream he was on, but I don't remember. Uh, so there's, uh, there's some questions going on in the chat. Um, is it legal if they are 18 and there's, uh, there's a split on this. I think it's state specific. Let's, let's say this though. It's typically against school policy and it might be illegal even if they are 18 because of the power dynamic between student and teacher. Uh, it's an improper relationship in basically every context. 
However, I will say, if the student is 18 and the teacher uh, obviously is over 18 because they're the teacher, whatever, that is legal. And if you're going to do that, that's fine. You should probably be fired, but you should not be criminally prosecuted for something that is legal age of consent. In my humble opinion, that is an administrative remedy. Fire the person. It's an relationship for the school. That's fine. I get it. But if it's legal, it should be legal. And uh, that I think is the, the only reasonable take on that. Well, it shouldn't be legal because they're, no, no, it shouldn't be proper fine they maybe shouldn't be a teacher fire them fire them then they can do all the fucking they want that's whatever this guy was uh this guy's like 20 uh 25 26 years old pretty fresh out of college and uh and he wants to have sex with 18 year olds i mean who's gonna what do, what do you do about that that's legal that's not even that's that's not even that weird right an eight-year age difference isn't that weird at all um I thought it was not the right behavior for the teacher. I thought <laughs> we didn't learn any fucking chemistry that year. Learned a lot about hacky sack though. Uh, for the record, I do not want to have sex or talk to any 18 year old women ever. They are. <sighs> They're not there. They're not there. I, I, I barely want to talk to anybody who's anywhere near the age of 18 to 20. Look, under 30, there are people under 30 who I will talk to. Sure. That list is small. Call me a bigot all you want. Ben Frail says, uh, Nadine Dirmad Rima Maith Dub 47. The Real Bambunga says, look, ma, no brain. Ghost of Recon says, we watched it live in grade school. Bad Dragon Knight says, speaking of racial slurs, how is Q doing? I don't know. I haven't talked to him in months. I haven't talked to him in months. I need to. Uh, Hip Hoopy says, Challenger exploded on my 25th birthday. Lots of teacher and space jokes here in New Hampshire. Tamara Holloway says, why did the Challenger crew drink Coke? They couldn't get seven up. You bred it. Shit. Uh, Tara Rayner says, thank you to all of you. I appreciate all of you. He would have loved Nick's streams and shared the same sense of humor. Fuck the cancer, the virus, and mandates that kept me from seeing him for two fucking years. Sorry to hear that, Tara. Sorry to hear that. I, Asia Frazier says, I didn't know 9-11 was real until a year after it happened. I saw it on the TV. My mom was freaking out. I thought it was a movie. Real Bambunga says, somebody told me about the Twin Towers. When I saw it at first, I thought it was old footage of the 93 basement truck bombing. Dude, uh, yeah, yeah, that's wild. So as uh, a good friend of mine was talking about guys who marry really young, right? Like their second marriage, guys who are 40 and 50 or whatever, and they, they grab some smoking hot, like 18 to 22 year old, right? And, uh, and they're like, yeah. Yeah, I'm gonna I'm gonna marry this one. And uh and my friend says to them, he's like, uh, you know, there's at least 22 hours of the day where you won't be having sex. Can you deal with them? <laughs> that's that's the question, right? At least that's a minimum 22 hours out of the day where where all of the bombshell looks don't matter. And, uh, are you, are you able to talk to them? So great, great, uh, great advice there. The real Bambunga. Wait, no, a APS DSM. Welcome to paralegal status. Ponton 21 says, Oh, sorry, sir. I would not have thrown that at you. If I realized you were retired. Phoenix Lord Asterman says, sent the sword and scale episode about this one. Uh, Twitter. It would make a good primer the case uh and then gosh the youtube thing stopped showing the super chat so we're almost done but i gotta grab the last couple that have come in since then jk win says fed started doing it in california passed the bill lawsuit filed i think if you're able to cover next week also joke was hilarious no n-word for that sec 
Uh, Patrick Allen says law and crying only made $2 in super chats this week. <laughs> oh shit. Guys, look, uh, live streams, live streams do not make ad revenue. They just don't. Well, I turn off the ads for the live plays. Cause if you have the ads on, it'll actually interrupt the live show and put you in an ad, which I think is ridiculous. Um, so I have the ads off for the live plays. Uh, they do not make ad revenue. They just don't. They don't do. They don't do it. It's uh, it's terrible. Now, watch time revenue for YouTube Red subscribers can can be very very big for those uh, for the streams if you have enough people watching. But that really scales up with the number of live viewers that you have. Um, so getting two dollars in super chats. Oh. Oh God, maybe they should try doing literally anything on their stream. Maybe they could do that. Vixel OP says I use brave browser, so I wouldn't see them anyways. By the way, my YouTube channel, my Twitch channel and my Twitter are all registered on brave. So if you, uh, if you do that time-based distribution, a great way to support the show is uh, is to watch on Brave if you uh, participate in the the basic attention token. I really really appreciate my Brave watchers who are out there. Um, I am I am registered on Brave, so uh, that that shit helps. It really does. Um, it's a great way if if people participate in that. Memecomics.com says Fredericks, uh, expenitent 13th century babies died with no love. Uh, Mr. Bentham says, yeah, but did you wash those books with soapy water? I did. Daniel Wozniak says, do I have guns in my house? Come over and find out. Joe K says, keep on rocking in the free world, but only if you're vaxxed, masked and boosted. Can you, these people, these fucking weirdos, it's like, uh, talking about freedom. There's a, there's an Eagle song that's basically about stop, stop bitching and whining. Uh, get over it. That's the song. Get over it by the Eagles. And you're like, holy shit, this song is right. This song is good. This song is correct. And then you hear the Eagles talk and you're like, where the fuck is get over it? You weirdos. This was you. What happened to you? Where did you go? When did you turn into a bitch? Get over it's a great fucking song though. I hate the fucking Eagles. Yeah, you can hate the you can hate the Eagles for sure. But that song, get over it. Like go read the, don't listen to it. Go read the lyrics. Go read the lyrics. It's anti everything that the Eagles believe in 2022. Streisand just said she'll pull her music off Spotify too. Again, no one listening to the amount of people listening to Spotify that are like, you know what I want to listen to right now? I want to listen to Barbara Streisand. Yeah, that's it. N no, that's not who people are pulling up on Spotify. These, these fucking boomer, uh, they don't even know how they're getting paid on Spotify. They don't understand the medium. They don't understand anything about it. And they're out here like, well, I'm going to put my, I'm Barbara Streisand. I'm very important. I'm Neil Young. Everybody knows Neil Young. No, nobody cares about you anymore, Neil Young. Again, you're talking about a hundred thousand across Spotify, a hundred thousand plays a day on Neil Young versus Taylor Swift, any Taylor Swift song. I'm talking about all Neil Young songs, a hundred thousand plays a day. Taylor Swift, six million a song, something like that. It's unreal the disparity between a modern pop artist. And someone like Neil Young or Joni Mitchell. Didn't Joni Mitchell do that fucking, uh, that, uh, that song about God being on the phone with the Pope or whatever. I can't fucking think of how that song went. These, these people, they're, they're still living in the nineties when their music, 
when the music gave them disproportionate impact and access. I'm sorry. Uh, I would listen to Chase Holfelter a thousand. I would listen to his songs a thousand to one over Neil Young. Uh, Neil Young song. I would rather listen to his cover of a Neil Young song. I don't know if he's even done one, but I would listen to that. I would listen to that over fucking uh, Neil Young. I'd rather listen to the Dan Vask remake of a Barbara Streisand song than her fucking boring old ass. All right. Um, Joe K. Wait, I read that one. Memecomics.com says sending you info of custom tool to eliminate stream pitfalls. Protect slash safeguard your command station. She'll email you. Also, special midweek trucker funnies now up. Bjornin 1979 says, hi, Nick. Legal advice, please. Forgot to tell auto insurance company that I moved to a new city. Been two months now. Think they know. What to tell them when I call. Just tell them you need to change your address. Who cares? Vince Olshov says the top 100 artists over, e over even 40 do not even get close to Joe Rogan's 11 million viewers per episode. Nope. No. I the, here's, the, here's the crazy thing. I probably approach Joni Mitchell views per day. Views per day versus her listens on Spotify. My views on YouTube versus Joni Mitchell plays on Spotify per day. Oh, I was saying uh, Joan Osborne is that one. Okay, Joni Mitchell. What, what the fuck did Joni Mitchell even sing? Let's see. Joni Mitchell. Oh, she's Canadian. Oh, fucking hell. I stand with Neil Young. What is Joni Mitchell's disease is the top question. Oh, God. She looks horrifying. Let's get to her disc discography. Uh, I just read through her discography. I don't fucking recognize a single song i thought she was joan osborne there's got to be a song that i recognize though there has to be one clouds court and spark help me it was record of the year nominated clouds was one down to you the hissing of summer lawns hajira chalk mark and rainstorm turbulent indigo both sides now river the joni letters one week last summer. Yeah, I can't uh, can't think of a single fucking song that I actually recognize from Joni Mitchell. So good job for her. Uh, like I said, I would put my YouTube views per day up to her Spotify plays per day. Th that's the that's the and look. I'm very cool and I'm wonderful. Um, but if YouTube lost me, I don't think they'd really know. I mean, I th think they'd know. Actually, no, let's be real on this. Views per day, sure. But I make YouTube more money through Super Chat cuts that they get than Joni Mitchell makes for Spotify. Guaranteed. I guarantee I make YouTube more money than Joni Mitchell makes for Spotify. Uh, yeah, these, these people have an inflated view of their own purpose and, and power because they, they lived through the sixties, seventies and eighties when being a folk musician mattered. Uh, Kalinka Pavlova says my chem teacher let three of us do an endurance competition with acid on our hands. I got second. Damn. Colonel panic. 2762 says thoughts on Canadian club is reasonably cheap whiskey. It's my every day, but when I want to splurge, it's Johnny gold or Shiva's regal 18. Uh, Colonel Perrick. Colonel, Colonel panic. Try Bearface whiskey, Canadian whiskey called Bearface. Give it a shot. 
Uh, I think it's good. I think it's good. Um, okay. Let's see. And then we've got memecomics.com says Frederick's experiment babies died without interaction. Uh, yeah. There you go. Yes. Okay. So that was going back to the thing where if you leave a baby on a table, they'll die. Yeah. Babies, babies die if you don't interact with them. Smoke Daddy says, YouTube keeps censoring my messages. I give up trying to figure out why. Here's five bucks. Thanks, Smoke Daddy. Sorry. Uh, I tried to I tried to call people manlets in a super chat the other day. Won't let you. Won't let you say little men either. Or won't let you say tiny men or short men. Shador says, government lists, politicians, plus their voting records. Pastor Flat. Nope. No government list. Let that. Because here's the thing. I don't want the government to keep track of politicians and their voting records. I want the people to keep track of that. That's more important for the people to keep track of because I believe the people will be honest about it. I believe the politicians will lie about themselves. Pastor Flash says, found the unbreaded prayer from Drinker Stream. Sent it to your Twitter and Discord. Let me uh, pull it up here. All right, here's the unbreaded prayer and we'll close out the show with this. Give us this day our daily unbreaded and forgive us our memes as we forgive those who meme against us. Lead us not to Jack Murphy for thine is the whiskey, the ranting and the gamer words now and forever. Amen and a women. Thank you, brother. Peace guys. That's the end of the show. I will see you tomorrow. Eric Hunley at 11 Friday night tights, whenever the fuck they start. And then Andrew Smith will be on with me tomorrow at 11 PM central and we're gonna have a good show catch you then peace peace oh he drinks a fair bit but you realize that it just helps get his noggin jogging along With his glass by his side and his kids asleep tight We'll hear some lost planning tonight With his microphone muted We'll laugh at this boom Until he explains it's all part of the plan Watch his face become redder As he becomes meta Raging at idiots from Twitter and Erland From the white shores of men to the hills of Grand Rivet There's no one who's playing the law His lady is fair and she handles herself with the grace of one who has borne many children. As the wife of a lawman, she makes sure that he has the time and the place to provide for them there. So pour out an art bag about more of that bright spirits blow as the ones who get on your blood. So pour out a glass for the tea post on Twitter and speak here lost planning tonight. From the white shores of Nam to the hills of Glen Levitt, there's no one who explains the wrong better than Nick. So pour out a glass for the ones who have passed to make the law what we have now. Oh, the guests are all planet folks, and Doug Tater drinks all. They bring that perspective and spice to the mix. But the reason we're here and the one that we cheer is the one who is showcasing us his career. Pour out a glass for the ones who have passed To make the love of me